Radio for the masses. Good evening. How are you? Today is Monday, February 6th. 37 days into the new year, just 328 days left. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black. For KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? It's Monday, it's a brand new week, and what a great week, man, coming up straight ahead. Ah, oh yeah, with that tonight, tonight we have author and researcher Scott Creighton is here, live from Scotland. Here to discuss The Great Pyramid Hoax, his new book, which which I've got right here in front of me. I've been talking about it a lot uh, over the last month or two on the show. The Great Pyramid Hoax, the conspiracy to conceal the true history of ancient Egypt. The foreword is by Laird Scranton, by the way. Great book. You need to pick it up if you haven't already. You will after tonight's show. It's an amazing book. It's a reference book. From here on out, tomorrow night on the show, yeah, kids, Dave Schrader is here. I cannot wait. Darkness, darkness is here tomorrow night. Dave Schrader. Oh, man. I've I've been so looking forward to this uh, for such a long time. So tomorrow night, Dave Schrader is here. Wednesday night. Now, we move things around this week. All right. Shuffle the schedule up a little bit. Wednesday night is a special fader night with John Rappaport, and our special guest uh, will be George Norrie, and uh, we will open up the phone lines and and do that. So that will be our fader night on Wednesday, because Thursday we're going to take off, because Friday we'll be broadcasting live from the Conscious Life Expo. So you still get four shows this week. Or excellent shows. It's going to be a busy week. And then uh, uh, we'll be at the uh, Conscious Life Expo all weekend. All right. So come down and hang out with us. We just posted up in Twitter. I want to remind all of you. Um, and I think I retweeted it. Did I do it already? Uh, the live stream for uh, the Conscious Life Expo is up. So if you cannot make it to the Conscious Life Expo, then uh, just get the live stream, and it does feature uh, the the entire event, but it will have Fade to Black that Friday night. So you'll be able to watch Fade to Black in stereo, full living, 1080p living color, uh, Fade to Black on Friday night. Okay, so there you go. We've got an excellent, uh, the most fantastic week lined up in front of us, and then the Conscious Life Expo. So come and hang out with us. Uh, our, our evening on Friday night, uh, we're going to have David Wilcock, Corey Good, um, Linda Moulton Howe, Richard Dolan, Mike Barra, um, Whitley Streber, um, Danian Brinkley, Nassim Haramain, uh, who am I leaving out, uh, 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 Kelly Walden, Kelly Sullivan, oh, I, I could just go on and on. So we're going to have uh, 14 guests lined up, and uh, there you go. So that's that's Friday night. It's going to be a very big evening and a lot of fun. So come and hang out with us, and uh, we'll have lots of stuff to give away. Uh, River Moon Coffee is going to be at Conscious Life, and I'm looking forward to that, hanging out with them. So we'll have some coffee to give away. So come and, come and hang out with us. And there you go. The Fader Knots, uh, I look forward to this every single year. Rita and I hanging out with all of you. Uh, you know, Holly's coming down. Uh, is is Nurse Nancy going to be here for this too, Re? Nancy's going to be here, right? Uh, uh, I've got a, a friend of mine from Panama, uh, Ricky Royals, coming down from San Francisco. So come and hang out with us at the bar and uh, wear your fade to black shirt. And there you go. All right. So let's get the show cracking. I'm very fired up. I'm back in the chair. We had such an amazing weekend 
uh, over at the house. Just an amazing weekend. We had a couple of friends over for dinner on uh, Saturday night. But other than that, it was all housework all weekend long. <laughs> Man alive. I had an apron on, a vacuum cleaner in one hand, and, and a screwdriver in the other. And it was uh, it was just fun over at the house, the things that you do on a, on a weekend off. And there you go. All right, so let's get this show cracking. Uh, follow us on Twitter, at JChurchRadio. It's uh, simple enough, at JChurchRadio. Come hang out with us on Twitter. The Sandbox is hashtag F2B. Sandbox is already on fire. I see all the Bob Marley stuff like I was going to forget that. I even saw the Axl Rose pop by. All right, we'll get to all of that in just a minute. Hashtag F2B is the Sandbox. Uh, we'll bust through a couple of thousand tweets tonight. Make a couple of them yours. Come and hang out with us. And uh, hashtag F2B is fade to black questions. F2BQ. Hashtag F2BQ is fade to black questions. Any questions or comments during the show tonight, hit me right there. Everything is in real time. Do subscribe to our podcast. We have over 600 archive shows there. Custom apps, Apple, Android. Just go to the Google Store. Go to iTunes. All platforms. Download what you want. It is free. And then go and subscribe to the podcast. $2 per month. It's that simple. Just go to jimmychurchradio.com, click on the podcast banner. $2 a month, 600 shows. All right. Check out all of our sponsors. Uh, that's how this show runs. The banners are over at jimmychurchradio.com. All the promo codes for discounts and free shipping and all those cool things for being a fade or not are right there in the banners. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. This weekend we'll be over at the Conscious Life Expo. That's right. February 10th through the 13th at the LAX Hilton. Tickets and information right now are over at jimmychurchradio.com. Click on the banner. And the live stream banner is there, too, as well. Oh, contact in the desert. May 19th through the 22nd in Joshua Tree, California. Tickets and info over at jimmychurchradio.com. Let's get this show cracking. Happy birthday to today. Axel Rose is 55. Double nickel. 85. Rick Astley. <laughs> Is this thing on? Is this thing on? Rick Astley today is 51. And I got to say, man, he was all right. <laughs> Rick Astley was all right. Our dead guy's birthdays today are Bob Marley, 1945 to 1981. Died at the age of 36. Changed the world. By the age of 36, with the release of Exodus in 1977, Marley established his worldwide reputation and produced his status as one of the world's best-selling artists of all time with sales of more than 75 million records. Exodus stayed on the British album charts for 56 consecutive weeks, included songs like Exodus, Waiting in Vain, Jamming, One Love, then in 1978, he released the album Kaya. And just three short years after that, he died of cancer. That's right. On May 11, 1981. So if you stop and think about it, 1977 to 1981, four short years, and he changed the world. Happy birthday, Bob Marley. And every, you know, every hipster in the world ended up going out and buying Legend and thought that they were automatically cool. But you know what? If you got Legend, you almost get a pass card, right? Happy birthday, Bob Marley. All right. OTD, on this day in history, 1998. Falco. Remember Falco? The man behind Rock Me Amadeus and Der Commissar. And possibly the biggest star to emerge from Austria since Herr Mozart himself died when his rental car was struck by a bus while he was vacationing in the Dominican Republic. On this day in history, 1998, Falco. Fader fact. The world record in cycling backwards while playing a violin is 60.45 kilometers, and it was done in five hours and eight seconds. All right. Don't ask me where I got that, but it was vetted. <laughs> uh, tonight, we have author and researcher Scott Creighton here. We're going to discuss one of the most amazing books I've read in a long time, The Great Pyramid Hoax. The thing is about this book, 
And I'm going to go into this um, um, in depth tonight with uh, Creighton. The thing is about this book, when I read something, I don't want fluff. I like, uh, and fluff is fine. You know, look, you know, I, I, I like Clive Cussler. You know, I, I like fluff. I, if it's done right. But this book is is so direct and to the point and and covers the bases um, at, at every angle when it comes to vice and and what happened in 1837 that it's uh it's one of those i read every single word i studied every single page and this this is a great book and tonight we're going to discuss that tomorrow night dave schrader's here host of beyond the darkness darkness radio he'll be here and then wednesday of course is a special fader night we've shifted things around so we're going to do fader night on wednesday Thursday night, we will be off air, best of replay. And then Friday night is the Conscious Life Expo, the live special broadcast. All right. Um, I don't know if you guys, uh, let me shift gears here. I don't know if you guys were aware of what went up in Berkeley, California, at the, at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, but it, it, things got out of control. And the Alliance for Global Justice, which is an organization funded by the Tides Foundation, a George Soros-backed charity, gave $50,000 to help fund a radical left group that used violence to shut down that event uh, up at Berkeley that was supposed to feature Milo Yiannopoulos. <clears throat> now, Whatever you think about Milo, it's neither here nor there, okay? Yeah, I, I think he's a, a cool dude, a strange dude, a weird dude, um, and one that I think likes the spotlight. Okay, so so whatever. It, it's not about Milo. But it's about what happened up there with masked activists, masked in black, joining the already large group of peaceful protesters that had gathered in the area between Sather Gate and the north end of Telegraph Avenue. And campus police were holding their positions. It was, it was peaceful. Everything was cool. At the entrance of Martin Luther King Jr. Student Union Building that was hosting the event. Everything was cool. Everything is good. And as the, as the gathered crowd got more agitated... These masked black block activists began hurtling projectiles, including bricks, lit fireworks, throwing rocks at the building and police. You know, and it was just a peaceful protest. All right, Milo, they didn't want Milo there. Okay, all right. Everybody's got the right to, to, to speak, right, to gather, to protest. But doing this inflated everything and got out of control. Some used police barriers as battering rams to attack the doors of the venue, which was uncool, breaching at least one of the doors and entering the venue on the first floor. But what feels strange to me is that it turned into a, a book-burning, hate-filled riot. It was violent. Someone was shot. And so what feels strange is that George Soros directly funded this uprising, right? And what be, he doesn't even live in the United States, you know, and he's, he's got these funds going on all around the world, hidden money running here and there. And this thing kicked off and it just didn't need to be that way. Not on a college campus and not this whole thing about, um, uh, uh, trying to prevent darkness. Right, that's that's the this this image that they're doing, right? And then there's book burning. What do you do? What what is what does that have to do on a college campus, especially about this event? Right, it was a total instigation, and the conspiracy here is that Soros is funding this thing, and I just feel uncomfortable with it. So I just wanted to state that um, as as I look into this a bit more and different. Events around the country that could possibly, I mean, there's $2.2 .2 million that have come in from Soros uh, into this uh, organization. It's just not right. 
and the you know these masked blacked crusaders coming in from out of town to start throwing bricks at the police ah, it's just it's not right it's not right so anyway i wanted to share this with you as well check this out one of the creepiest stories that i can comment on and share with you and it has an ending stefano brizzi stefano brizzi who was imprisoned for murdering a police officer and dissolving his body in acid, has been found dead in jail. A prison spokesperson confirmed that Britsy, 50, died yesterday at HMP Belmarsh in southeast London. The police added, and I'm quoting here, as with all death... <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, serious faces back on. The police added, and I'm quoting, as with all deaths in custody, there will be an independent investigation. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> yeah, right. Police believe that Britsy. Now, this is, this is about as dark of a story as I can relate to you, but just wrap your mind around this. They believe that Britsy had attempted to cook and eat this police officer. His name was Mr. Semple. Mr. Semple's body after strangling him. Now, how these two got together, that's that's a whole other situation. But it, it doesn't affect this story. Investigators found a leg on a roasting tin in the oven and found traces of Mr. Semple's DNA on grease in a cooker in a blender, and on a set of chopsticks. Are you listening? Detectives also discovered pieces of his flesh floating in chemicals in the bath, in his bathroom, and a forensic dentist found that a bite mark on a discarded rib in the kitchen matched Britsy's lower teeth. <laughs> oh, man. During his trial at the Old Bailey, the court heard that Britsy was a fan of the Breaking Bad TV series and had been inspired by an episode of the show to dissolve Semple's body in acid. He was arrested when police discovered the gruesome scene after being called to his apartment to investigate a foul stench. You think? But it reminds you of, uh, of uh, <laughs> you know, Dahmer, right? Seriously, no investigation needed here, folks. All right? I, I've solved everything. You kill and eat a cop. You get caught. You get convicted. You go to prison. You will be found dead. That's it. That's that's it. There's no investigation. Nobody's going to find out how he died or who did it or anything like that. There's no who done it here. That's it. That's the end of the story. But it's one of the craziest. And when you read the details of all of this, it's disturbed reading. But it had the correct ending. So there you go. And here here you have something else. I wanted to <laughs> I know, right? I'm watching Twitter here, dazed. <laughs> <I know. laughs> That's good. But it's, it's, it's real. And, you know, we have a very, very, very large audience over in the U.K. And they're hearing me uh, relay this to everyone. And they know that I've toned it down. I've toned it way, way, way down. There could be kids listening to this show. But I just dig the ending. And, and the comments from the police department, let me, it's right here. Hold on. Where, where, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Right here. All right. As with all deaths in custody, there will be an independent investigation. There you go. That's from the police. All right. Uh, and here we have conveniently timed, conveniently timed for two weeks after the inauguration. I'm going to share this for your listening pleasure. Vandenberg Air Force Base is set to launch an unarmed Minuteman 3 missile. 
right? An operational test launch of an Air Force Global Strike Command unarmed Minuteman III missile is scheduled to take place right here in Southern California from Vandenberg Air Force Base between 11.03 p.m. tomorrow night, Tuesday, and 5.03 a.m. Wednesday. Now, here in Southern California, we look forward to these missile launches, and it happens right here in Los Angeles, right here on the coast. They are dramatic, and they are cool. Um, And, well, they will scare the crap out of you if, if you don't know that it's about to happen. Uh, the first time uh, back in the early 80s that I witnessed a missile launch out of Vandenberg and I didn't know what was going on, I thought it was World War III. I mean, that's the first thing that, I mean, seriously, I was walking down the steps of this apartment building over in um, Alhambra, and I see this missile taking off out, out of the trees. And it was about, it was at dusk. You know, so it was uh, starting, just starting to get dark. Sun was setting. And I'm watching this massive rocket just fire straight off into space. And the vapor trail that it left hung there for what seemed like probably 30 minutes. And I'm not exaggerating. It stayed up there forever, glowing in these weird colors, bouncing off the uh, the sunlight from the uh, uh, the setting sun. And when something like that happens, and I didn't know, I didn't know what was going on. I flipped out and I just thought, man, I got to get home. I got to pack my bag. I got to drive my car to the mountains. Uh, the Russian missiles are going to be coming this way any second. I didn't know until I jumped on TV. I was with a few other people too and uh, and saw that it was just this Minuteman launch. Well, anyway, back to this. The operational test launch is going to happen. Uh, it's going to happen tomorrow night. The purpose of launching the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, or ICBM, is to validate and verify the effectiveness, readiness, and accuracy of the weapon systems. And this is according to the Air Force Global Strike Command. Team Vandenberg, and I'm quoting here from the press release, is poised to provide safe launch operations in support of the Air Force Global Strike Command's important demonstration of our nation's secure and effective combat-ready ICBM force. The last test launch of an unarmed Minuteman 3 from Vandenberg occurred on September 5th, 2016. I reported about it on this show. It's uh, strategically timed. Two weeks after uh, Trump takes office, let's uh, show the world what we got. Let's flex our muscles. But that's exactly what this is. Make no mistake about it. And it's going to happen tomorrow night right here in Los Angeles. So uh, this is my public service announcement. When you see this thing take off tomorrow night, you'll know it's just a test and it is unarmed. All right. And if you're going to be out there, videotape it for me, will you? Send it in. Also, before I wrap up here, another public service announcement. Tragedy hit home for us here in Los Angeles over the weekend. Because the Anaheim White House restaurant, a landmark here in Southern California, caught fire this past Saturday morning. Uh, Anaheim Fire and Rescue officials received a call of a commercial structure fire in the 800 block of South Anaheim Boulevard around 418 a.m. Approximately 40 firefighters from Anaheim Orange County Fire Department, Garden Grove Fire Department, and Fullerton Fire worked uh, on extinguishing the heavy flames. It went up in smoke. From the building's roof, by the way. The aggressive fire was knocked down in about 30 minutes, but fire crews continued working on hot spots throughout the three-story restaurant for nearly three hours. Sir Bruno Serrato, the owner of the Anaheim White House restaurant, used the, and this is a gourmet establishment, by the way. I mean, a top-shelf restaurant. But he used the restaurant's kitchen to feed 2,000 underprivileged Southern California children every single day. And this is an institution here in Southern California. And everybody, every year, the the fundraising and the things that go on at the White House uh, so they can feed 2,000 kids every single day. Bruno Serrato is somebody that is so admired here in Southern California. And to have this happen and to hear him speaking about this so passionately in the tears. 
because he didn't care about the restaurant. He cared about the kids, cared about his restaurant staff and the people that were out of work. And, you know, it's going to take years to rebuild. This restaurant was big. Serato is an Italian immigrant who came to the U.S. with $50 in his pocket and worked his butt off to open this restaurant 30 years ago. I've eaten there many, many times over this uh, over the years. And this is a total bummer to all of us here in Southern California. So I'm just going to say this to our audience. There's a GoFundMe page set up for donations. And we're going to put this up right now in Twitter. It's GoFundMe.com forward slash Anaheim White House. That's all you got to do. Go click on it. Um, the, uh, uh, the goal is $750,000 to rebuild the restaurant uh, right before showtime tonight. It was getting close to a hundred grand, and that's pretty good in 24 hours. Um, everybody here in Southern California knows what the White House restaurant uh, means to the children of our community and our community in general. And uh, it was just a sad day here in Southern California. All right, so with that, let's get out of here because I want to get Scott Creighton in here tonight. It is the Great Pyramid Hoax. I've been talking about this book for a couple of months tonight. Scott Creighton is here live from Scotland. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Email is Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. I'll be right back with Scott Creighton. Stay with us. Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black. You create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights. Just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. Hi, folks. In a world of GMO, genetically modified organisms, that is, chemicals, processed foods, and a healthcare system that's unraveling like a cheap suit, it's time to prepare. God created herbs, and herbs help man. Our body can heal itself, just sometimes we need assistance. You need some help? GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Our mild detox is quite powerful with its unique blend of eight different herbs. And if you're looking for more, our non-GMO supplements will help you with different needs you might have. Health should be a top priority. Take care of your health naturally. Log on to GetTheTea.com. Dot com. That's get the tea dot com. Give your body a treat. Let the herbs do their thing naturally. Read all the testimonies on the website. Get the tea dot com. That's get the tea dot com. Sickness and viruses are like intruders and herbs are like warriors. Let the tea work for you. That's get the tea dot com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. 
Hi, this is Chase Klutzke with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station, where the Fade or Nots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Jimmy Church Church Radio. All right, welcome back, Fade to Black. Our host, Jimmy Church. Very excited about tonight's guest, Scott Creighton. I've been talking about this book now for a couple of months. Uh, when I first received it, I could not believe my eyes. I was like, this is the book that needs to be written and read. It's called The Great Pyramid Hoax, The Conspiracy, to conceal the true history of ancient Egypt. Scott Creighton is an engineer whose extensive travels have allowed him to explore many of the world's ancient sacred sites. The host of the Alternative Egyptology Forum on AboveTopSecret.com. He lives in Glasgow, Scotland. Tonight, Scott Creighton will reveal how the only hard evidence that dates the Great Pyramid, the quarry marks discovered by Colonel Weiss in 1837, was forged. Creighton's study strikes down one of the most fundamental assertions of orthodox Egyptologists and reopens the longstanding questions about the Great Pyramid's true age, who really built it, and why. You can get the book right now at Inner Traditions, and uh, just click on author Scott Creighton, and I would like to welcome to Fade to Black, live from Glasgow. Scott Creighton. Scott, good evening. Good morning. (laughs) (laughs) Good morning, Jimmy. How are you? Yeah, go ahead and freak me out right now and tell me what time it is over there. It's um, it's about 25 to 4 (laughs) a.m., so I'm sitting here with a big mug of coffee just to try and um, keep me upright. Yeah, I know you are, and thank you so much. What was, uh, I'll just tell everybody right now, uh, Scott hit us back uh, last week. He's like, man, I love doing shows so early in the morning for you Americans. (laughs) But I'll, I'll be ready to go. So just just thank you for that. And our audience has been listening uh, to me both um, over our coast to coast and here on Fade to Black for the last uh, uh, couple of uh, months talking about this book and the importance of it. And so it's a treat for me uh, because this audience and I and, and my wife, Rita, too, we we study Egypt on this show. We study everything. But Egypt is 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 front and center on this show. So we're we're going to go through this book tonight uh, complete, and and I encourage everybody to go and get their own copy. I consider it a reference book, okay? I really do, Scott, and I think that as as time goes by, people are going to uh, refer back to you and this book um, uh, for a long time to come. And so, congratulations on that. All right, and I and I truly mean that. But now, all the bro love is over. Let's get serious. <laughs> You're a first-time guest on this show, so you get the first-time guest disclaimer, okay? <laughs> okay. And that disclaimer is this. This is just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. Where the conversation goes, it goes. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. Are you ready? Let's go for this. All right. That's what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> tell me really quick, for you to, um, and all of your books, by the way, in your research, um, uh, you've chosen this path in life. I want to go back to your childhood. Were your parents crazy? Were they part of your outlook on life that has caused you to go and, and try to discover things? Um, probably not, Jimmy, to be honest. My parents, I think, um, I think I was a bit of a trial really <laughs> to my parents. Um, I, totally came most of the time from parents from total left field asking them all sorts of questions that they just didn't know the answers to because well for them you know they're they're brought up with um, their own education you know via the the conventional um, educational system 
um, which has very traditional views. And um, a lot of these views, you know, when you're a kid, you know, you're constantly asking questions, but why, but why, but why? You keep asking why, you keep asking why. And eventually, you know, they ran out of answers. And, you know, I was, I was just... A very, very inquisitive child. Um, the pyramids of uh, Egypt held a particular fascination. I mean, look at these things, Jimmy. They're, you know, they're just huge, absolutely huge. And you're thinking to yourself as a kid, how could this be the tomb for one guy, just one guy? Look at the site. You know, these things. You know, kids are fascinated by dinosaurs, right? Right. These right. massive, ferocious animals. The pyramids for me, well, they're much bigger than dinosaurs. So, you know, I was just hooked on Egypt um, as a kid. And, you know, I was constantly asking my parents about them. And, you know, they would go and get me books and stuff. You know, they would, they would encourage it. Um, but I wouldn't say they had a particular um, interest themselves, but they, they were certainly encouraging, um, certainly not discouraging. So um, obviously my interest grew um, from there as a kid. But, you know, as you get older, uh, you realise that what you've been taught at school, that these structures were the tombs of the pharaohs. Right, um, right. You realise you realize the conventional story, the conventional narrative has so many holes in that narrative, it, you know, it just eventually just doesn't add up, it just doesn't make sense. And for me, well, that just wasn't good enough. I had to find answers that satisfied me. What I wanted to uh, ask you is with, um, you know, Edinburgh being right there and, and the the megalithic structures, you know, in Ireland and, and of course, Stonehenge, did you go out and explore uh, those structures as a kid? Yeah, I've been um, been to most of these places, uh, the the Callanish stones as well, up in the far north of Scotland. Um, you know, uh, obviously Stonehenge as well. Yeah, so I've been um, Roslyn Chapel. That's just that's just along the road, more or less. You know, so um, yeah, I've been to all these all of these um, fascinating historical sites yeah have you been up to scarabray i've not been to scarabray it's um it's obviously a place um i, w- I would dearly love to go and it's on definitely on my um, bucket list right uh, and and uh uh, Laird Scranton, who wrote the introduction to the Great Pyramid Hoax, he's he's just written a, a new book about um, Scarabray. Coincidentally, I've got it right here. <laughs> he, ah, yeah, yeah he was just on the show talking about it, and uh, we love Laird. And his introduction to the book, by the way, uh, was was most excellent. And let, let's actually jump into the book. Um, I, I want to say this, and I'm I'm going to start uh, kind of at the end and then we'll go back to the beginning and work our way forward. But the conclusions of what is going on here is a game changer. Okay. We, we know uh, that that Sitchin uh, first proposed this and we'll talk about that too, as well. He had to back off on that. And, and I like the way that you present that section in the book and why, you know, with Graham Hancock and so forth. Um, and I understand that. And I think that we all did. But we know that the Great Pyramid is not what, you know, Orthodox uh, Egyptologists or uh, academia presents it today. We know that it's not that. Now, this book is such a game changer that it will force people to, in the Orthodox realms, to rewrite history. Do you think that they're actually going to do that? Do you think Wikipedia is going to get updated? You know, (laughs) all of these textbooks. Well, the the problem there, Jimmy, is that um, you've got the the gatekeepers, and the gatekeepers are all from the the present establishment, and they're all currently more or less still in place. Um, You find that... um, this is especially so you find on Wikipedia. It's incredible, you know, that um, you you go on there and you make a suggestion for a modification and there are people on there that just fight and fight and they're really ferocious about protecting, you know, what it is, you know, the, the current paradigm. They're just absolute, you know, um, really, you know, determined that, that nothing should be changed. So, 
I think personally, um, this book, I think in time, it probably will make a difference, but it's not going to happen overnight. I'm realistic about that. Um, we basically need to wait for the old guard to kind of basically move on. And people, younger people today who are reading you know, other views, reading my books, uh, the books of Graham, Robert Baval, Robert Shock, uh, John Anthony West, and so forth and so on, um, look at these guys' ideas, assess them, obviously, and, you know, see where they fit in. And hopefully um, they'll take some of the ideas from these books and, you know, try and break the doors down because this is this is what it's about, you know. I, I call it a, these, these marks essentially are, are, are what I call an, a convenient untruth. That's what they represent. They're there as a, a barrier to prevent progress. And if you remove that barrier, then, you know, we open the door to other possibilities. And you find that the establishment, the academia, they, they basically think they've got it covered that they know most of the answers, not all the answers, but probably most of the answers. And the, the simple fact is this book shows they're wrong. They're wrong about this particular um, case, this um, particular situation, and it needs to be addressed. Now, I don't know if the <laughs> ever will. I think hopefully in the future at some time it, it will. But as I said, Jimmy, I'm a realist. It's not going to happen overnight. But as Graham Hancock tweeted the other day, Egypt he said Egyptologists need to take this book seriously. Yeah, they have to. And one of the points that I have driven home, and I will continue, Scott. I, you, you don't think it's going to happen overnight? I'll make sure that it does. Okay, I'll make it my mission. But I'm going to say this. The those uh, the gang graffiti and and the Khufu cartouche were put there because of ego, right? They, they weren't put there. They were put there for Vice's ego. He just he had to get, you know, his his name in the books. And, and that was his goal. What what I don't think that he realized then by making it his ego and, and doing this was that everything in Egyptology was going to hinge on that cartouche and on those gang signs, because there's nothing else that says Khufu anywhere. Uh, or in any pyramid, for that matter, but but that certainly includes the Great Pyramid. It was done because of ego, and that ego has forced all of history to be written in a certain way, and that dogma is because of ego. Am I wrong in saying it like that? I think you're perfectly correct in saying it like that, Jimmy. That's one of the motives that I give in the book as to why vice actually perpetrated this hoax was um, he basically, if you read his published account, he says over and over again that he wanted to make an important discovery. It was almost becoming an obsession for him to, to discover something important. And he says specifically in his book that he wanted to discover the cartouche of a king. Now, just for your listeners who maybe don't know what a cartouche is, a cartouche is essentially, um, it's like a, it's shaped like a kind of bullet. That It comes from the French word cartridge, which is the name for a, a casing of a, a bullet shell. And inside this shape, this cartridge shape, there are hieroglyphics, and that always represents the name of a king. So the cartouche is always the name of the king. And this king was found, this king's name is supposedly found inside the Great Pyramid by Colonel Weiss in 1837. But as I said, Weiss in his published account stated over and over that he wanted to find something important and specifically the cartouche of a king that would allow him and academics to date the pyramid. Now, I suspect Vice, as you say, Jimmy, probably wanted to do this for notoriety, um, to get his name in the history books, because he was a wealthy man. He did not need the money. 
He was a very, very wealthy man in his own right. He came from the, you know, he was very close to the British aristocracy, the ruling elite of the day, you know, so he didn't need the money. Um, you know, so uh, the other possible motive is he spent an awful lot of money. He spent something like £10,000 during his excavations and his operations at Giza, which in 1837, that, that works out to be something like $1.3 million. Right. Jimmy. Now, that's, that's a lot of money, and it has to be said it's a lot of incentive as well to make sure you find something, you know, you come out of these operations, you know, with something. And, of course, as well, you have have, you know, issues. There was it was very competitive as well at that time. You, had, you know, French explorers, German, Italian explorers, and they're all kind of competing with each other. And Vice was finding nothing, well, nothing of great importance. He found some artifacts which he would send back to the British Museum, but he wasn't finding the important thing. He wanted to find the mummy of the king or. A cartouche. That's the two things he really wanted to find, and he was finding neither of them until eventually, of course, he did find this um, cartouche. But there, there's all sorts of um, motives which I go into um, in the book, um, as, as you obviously know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get to that right after the break, and we're going to uh, head to a break here in a few minutes. I want to uh, clarify something, too, as well. This wasn't the only hoax that he did on the Giza uh, Plateau. We have uh, what happened over in, in Makare and, and that pyramid, too, as well. Can you share with us uh, what he did in, in that chamber on the inside of that pyramid? Well, in um, the Pyramid of Menkaura, that's the, the third of the giant, the smallest of the three big pyramids at, at Giza. Um, his team apparently discovered a coffin and um, some mummy wrappings as well in this coffin inside the, the burial chamber. Now, there had been other people um, that had explored this chamber before Vice arrived, you know, had explored this pyramid before Vice arrived. But for some reason, all those other explorers totally missed discovering this, this coffin lid. And this coffin lid had the name Minkaura, um <laughs> <laughs> written in it in, in hieroglyphics, obviously. And they found some mummy wrappings as well and some bones as well, some human bones. But it turns out that the coffin lid was from a much, much later dynasty, the 26th dynasty, I believe, which is like, you know, 20 do, 22 dynasties after this pyramid was actually built. And the, the bones were radiocarbon dated to the, the early Christian era, about 300 AD. You know, so you've got, you've got bones from one time and a, a coffin lid from another time, none of which was contemporary with the, the supposed construction of this particular pyramid. You know, so it just begs the question, you know, how on earth did that happen when no one else had ever discovered these things um, in previous excavations of that um, pyramid? So he was just walking around Giza, Right. <laughs> right. Just trying yeah. to find yeah. something to get his name tied to, because everybody was discovering things back in 1837. What a great time to be in Egypt. Right. Everything yeah. was new and fresh and discovering things. And he was doing everything that he could to make his mark there. And when it comes to the Menkari pyramid, that right there, why wouldn't historians say, look, he did this with that pyramid and now he's doing this over here at the great pyramid there's something fishy going on let's let's look into this guy but nobody has i don't understand the minkora episode is very much one of these situations jimmy that was let's just say brushed under the carpet right and right no right. longer spoken about you know once um carbon dating technology arrived back in the 50s and, and 60s um they realized that they had a problem with these particular artifacts they knew that the the mummy board the, the the coffin lid that was found was from a much later time but the bones well the, the they weren't sure about the bones maybe they they felt that the there was maybe a reburial using a later coffin um, for the, the, the body, but it turns out the bones weren't contemporary with the, the structure either once these were carbon dated. You know, so 
it's just been quietly ignored and brushed under the carpet. And, you know, this is the thing, Jimmy. This subject has not been spoken about properly since Colonel Weiss discovered these marks. This book, apart from the, the early work by, by Zechariah, um, this book is the first book which has made a serious attempt at really analysing and scrutinising in meticulous detail these marks that were allegedly found in these chambers. This is the first time it's ever been done. And my goodness, you know, there's, there's so many questions that um, this research that I've put in this book raises. Uh, how do you, uh, we've got 60 seconds, so you can answer this really quick. How do you feel now? You must feel great to get this book out there and have it be uh, so uh, comprehensive. There's no details left. You've you've laid out the perfect case. I believe it's a hoax. That's it. There's no question in my mind. How do you feel right now? Um, well, it's good to get the book out there, Jimmy. But, you know, when I was compiling and researching the book, I felt myself becoming angrier and angrier because I felt as if we'd been cheated. We've been cheated out of our history by this hoax for the best part of 200 years. And that annoys me, and it still annoys me to this day. Let's take a break right here, Scott. Awesome start to the show. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Sumi Church. Our guest tonight, Scott Creighton. We're talking about his book, The Great Pyramid Hoax, The Conspiracy to Conceal the True History of Ancient Egypt. It is a game changer. This is Fade to Black. More with Scott right after this short break. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón. Y los invito para que escuchen mi buen amigo, Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Oh, fall. My favorite time of year. Cooler temperatures and, well, let's be honest, layers. Lots and lots of layers. Look, I get it. We all have that favorite hoodie. Matter of fact, I've got a few favorite hoodies. You should wear yours. Enjoy it. I do. But I stay focused on my health year-round. And for me, I take Nature's Youth RSF from naturesyouth.com. Nature's Youth RSF from naturesyouth.com. I eat right, control my portion sizes, still maintain a commitment to regular fitness, and I get plenty of rest and I take Nature's Youth RSF. It's okay to cover up your beach body for a few months, but don't just forget about it. Nature's Youth understands exactly what it means to provide top quality health products, and Nature's Youth customers not only improve their health, they know they're also providing their body with the right nourishment to maintain peak performance levels and fight the aging process. So layer up and get started today with Nature's Youth RSF. Nature'sYouth.com. Simple to use, even simpler to order. Go to Nature'sYouth.com. That's Nature'sYouth.com. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is a revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. Back to Fade to Black, our guest tonight, Scott Creighton, talking about his book, The Great Pyramid Hoax. This portion of Fade to Black is brought to you by Life Change Tea. Just go right now, click on the banners at jimmychurchradio.com, forgettheTea.com. Just mention Jimmy when you order, either over the phone or online. And because you know somebody, you're going to get yourself 
some free shipping. All right, let's get back to Scott. Oh, you know, I was just listening to the commercial there, and I heard uh, Reese Ephens uh, <laughs> do his little thing. I just saw the movie Snowden uh, with Rita, and Reese Ephens, I'm like, who is his teacher here at the CIA? Turns out it was Reese Ephens. I was like, man, that's Reese. And uh, Reese is all grown up and uh, turned into a real actor. He's he's always been great. But anyway, I, I just heard Reese's uh, little thing. I had to go there. Um, let's get back to uh, Vice. And what I would like to do, because it's such an intriguing story, Scott, that I kind of want to paint the picture here for the audience as to what was going on. So let's go back to 1837 and the the king's chamber and and what vice was doing and the chambers that are above because i talk about it all the time but unless you know the layout of the great pyramid you may or may not know what i am talking about as as i describe this so let's go back uh and uh, to the king's chamber in 1837 what was vice doing and what are these chambers that are above the king's chamber Okay, Jimmy, the, these small chambers above the King's Chamber, the King's Chamber uh, is the main chamber within the Great Pyramid where the so-called sarcophagus is situated. Now, above this chamber, there are five what are called relieving chambers, and they're roughly the same dimensions as the King's Chamber. Um, they're about... Um, 25, 30 feet long by about 15 feet wide, something like that. But they're only each each of these chambers are only about uh, three feet high with a, a you know a flat ceiling, only about three feet high. So you have to crouch inside these chambers. The topmost chamber is the only one of the five that you can stand up. That's got a, you know a gabled um, roof. So each of these chambers, the, the very first one above the King's Chamber is called Davison's Chamber. And, and interestingly, that particular chamber was discovered, uh, I think it was about 70 years prior to Vice actually going to Egypt by a chap called Nathaniel Davison. So that one had already been discovered. Vice discovered the chambers above Davison's Chamber, which he named as uh, uh, Wellington's Chamber, Nelson's Chamber, Lady Arbuthnot's Chamber, and Campbell's Chamber. These are all obviously the first two of the the sort of heroes of the British Napoleonic Wars, and the other two are you know um, people that Vice knew uh, at his time in Egypt. And interestingly, so, here let me jump in really quick. Davidson's chamber. Now, these are like five attics, everybody. You know, that's what it is, like five uh, spaces above uh, the king's chamber. Davidson's chamber, strangely enough, it did not have any gang graffiti or or marks in it, did it? Not one has ever been found inside Davidson's chamber. And as you rightly point out, Jimmy, that's a very curious anomaly because, <laughs> you know, if these guys, if these quarry gangs were placing... See, what they would do is they would cut these stones, apparently, at the quarries. And once the stone was cut, each gang or crew that cut these stones, they would place their mark on their work, kind of like, like a, you know, a, a stamp if you like, this is our work, you know. So they would put their their crew name on each of these blocks as they were cut at the quarries before they're shipped to the pyramid. Now, if they are doing that, and this is the orthodox explanation as to why we find these marks, these painted ochre painted marks inside these chambers, is because this is what the quarry gangs did. But the curious thing is, if they were doing that as a matter of course, as you know, a, a practice to place, you know, a regular practice of placing their name on their work. Why aren't there any blocks in Davison's chamber with any of these quarry gang names on those blocks? The only ones we find are in those chambers that were blasted open by Colonel Vice. Yeah, it it it's 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 so obvious. The reason why there isn't any Khufu cartouches or gang graffiti in Davidson's chamber is because somebody was already there. 
right? And and th- nothing was documented because there wasn't anything there. So Vice, therefore, couldn't hoax anything in Davidson's chamber. He could only do it in the chambers that he blasted his way into, and he was the first person to see on the inside of those chambers. That's exactly that's exactly correct, Jimmy. You, you can't basically put something in a chamber where there's been so many other people in that chamber that know there was nothing there. So you can't then come along subsequently put you know a cartouche in that chamber because everybody will go that wasn't there last week <laughs> right you know and 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 you know the 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 quarrymen if if you will just happen to not put their gang symbols only on the first floor they forgot or or you know that it, it, it's it's just outrageous i don't know how vice thought that he could pull this off but he certainly did and they bought into uh, his narrative, no doubt. Um, now, this is what I, I want to uh, uh, relay to everybody. This is another point, and then I want to move on. The the rocks or are, are the uh, the the granite, these blocks, were brought in from hundreds of miles away, and this is red ochre paint. This wasn't engraved. This wasn't carved. This was paint, and none of it was damaged as it was dragged across the desert for probably years, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a couple of issues there, Jimmy. The, this, the, the, you actually touched on another curious aspect of this whole thing. There are two types of blocks that, that make up these chambers. There are granite blocks and there are limestone blocks. Now, the granite blocks mainly make up the, the flooring and the roofing of these chambers. Uh, the underside, of of the granite block is the ceiling of the chamber below, and above it is the floor of the chamber above. Right. The, the walls are mainly limestone blocks. But the curious thing is, is that you find that the granite blocks on the floor and, the, and the, the roof, the granite blocks, there's no quarry marks whatsoever. It's like the guys that did the the granite cut the granite blocks you know which is much harder and a lot more physical job hard job to do obviously didn't take any pride in their work or, and put their their gang name on the granite blocks the limestone blocks which were cut um from on the site ch- Chura, you know they're much easier and yet we find you know there's gang names on the limestone blocks but not the granite blocks really curious situation yeah, and, and moving these blocks into position, both the granite blocks and the limestone blocks, this is a labor-intensive job. What no, no matter how it was done, whether it was done by E.T. or it was done by humans, it doesn't matter. These are huge, heavy blocks, and none of the graffiti got damaged. Yeah, that, these blocks get weigh somewhere in the order of between um, 40 and 70 tonnes. Okay, this is what we're talking about. They're not easy to move about. But one of the things that the ancient Egyptians would do, Jimmy, to to help reduce the friction in moving these blocks is they would, they would lay down some um, liquid um, gypsum, some liquid, a very thin um, mortar, um, liquid mortar or gypsum, uh, a slurry, basically, and they would use that to slide the blocks because this slurry would um, reduce the friction of the blocks. And in these chambers, you can actually see some of it in some of the photographs of the chambers. You can see it running down the sides of the right, walls. Right, right. It oozes out the side and runs down um, the walls of the chamber. But the remarkable thing is, in Campbell's chamber, where you can see the underside of these blocks... Um, where they would have used the slurry to slide it into place. If there was slurry used, how come we can see, you know, this plaster slurry, how come we can see the, the, the quarry marks? How come we can see the cartouche perfectly? Why isn't it smeared with slurry? Right, or dripped on. Or and dripped see, on, yeah. I, and there, and there's, if, there's another uh, a curious point here, is that... All of the, uh, bar none, all of these marks, all of the painting that was done is done either in plain view on an open spot and is not dripped on, it's not scratched, and it's not half a mark like it was hidden behind another granite block. You know, none of that. Everything is out in the open because why? Because they were going in there just painting willy-nilly. 
right? They were just finding an open spot where they could get the whole symbol in there, and that's what they would do. I, nobody questioned this. I don't get it. If I'm a detective, it doesn't take much to figure this out, but they chose to ignore it. Yeah, it's this is what I, I think I said at the top of the show. This is a convenient untruth. I actually genuinely believe, Jimmy, that the powers that be in Egypt know that these marks are fake. I've been emailed personally by Egyptologists to say, yeah, you're right, we know they're fake. I can't give the names for that because it's more than their job's worth. But the marks are fake. You know, this um, slurry, none of them, you know, there's the slurry dripping down all these walls. How come none of these painted marks have any slurry going over the top of them? If these blocks had these marks painted at the quarry and then slid into place, you would have the slurry going over the tops of these quarry marks. But none of them, we find none of them with any slurry going over the tops of these marks. It's like the the forgers deliberately made sure that they avoided areas where there was slurry because they couldn't place these marks over the slurry because that would then show that the marks were painted in situ and not at the quarries. And what you have to then ask, because some of these marks are upside down to make it look convincing, to make it look as though the mark was painted at the quarry. Yeah, and the, it only ended up upside down with the builders turning the block um, to find the best way to fit that block into place. So how come, you know, these these marks just magically managed to avoid all these runs of slurry? You would think if these marks had been placed on these blocks at the quarry and then put into place using this slurry, you know, this that's reduced the friction to move these blocks running down this wall, you would think at least some of these marks would have some of this slurry going over the top of these marks, but the forgers made sure, they were very careful to make sure that they did not place any cartouche or sign on top of this slurry, because if it's on top of the slurry, it means it's been done in situ. Yeah, and then game you have over. to ask yourself, why right. is a cartouche upside down in right. situ? Right, right. Game over there, for sure. But um, the uh, if there was a half a cartouche, right, that was hidden behind a seam, right, right, you know, some 50-ton block, well, then we know it was done at that time, and, and we could move on from this. But there isn't there isn't an example of that. Everything is out in plain view, which is but, which for Sitchin. Okay, there's two points I need to uh, cover before we head out of the break. Uh, one of them you just brought up that uh, Zahi Haiwas or or Cairo in general, uh, the Antiquities uh, Department they they don't want this investigated. There's reasons why nobody's gone up there and done any invest or photographed or done anything because they don't want this blown out. I want to address that. The second thing is Sitchin knew he, he, his, 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 his senses were telling him something is not right here. He was on to something, but what he didn't have was uh, Vice's personal uh, journals and he didn't have access to that, but that's what you did. You got on the scent of the trail and you went off after Vice's personal journals tell me how you found them and how you uh, were able to to head out with your wife and and get this part of it done because it's an amazing story okay it stood to reason that because vice's um published account of his time in egypt his published account is um over three volumes uh, jimmy you know three hefty books and they're written in a diary form so that tells you right away that he obviously was working from, you know, his field notes, a diary, a journal. So there had to be, you know, a journal. And, you know, I've been looking, I have to say, probably half-heartedly, you know, over a number of years um, for this um, particular journal. And, um, you know, always came up with a, a blank end, you know, a, a dead end. Um and then one day I just happened to um, just type in, you know, our friend Google and up popped this reference to the, the Vice manuscripts. 
in some obscure little archive centre to the north of London. And I thought, wow, you know, <laughs> have to go there, have to see this document. And, you know, be, d I had reasons why I needed to see this document. And it goes back to some of the earlier work done by Sitchin, because you know, Zechariah didn't have access to this document, but he was, he was saying presenting some evidence that could be verified by this document if I could see it. And I did manage to track it down. I did manage to see it, all 600 pages of it, in a incredibly badly written, I have to say, difficult to read handwriting. And my goodness, I found a lot more than I was bargaining for. The uh, the ability to photograph these in high res, did you expect that to be allowed? You, you, you must have been elated for them to say, you know, go ahead, yeah, photograph it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it was, um, the, the, it's just, for, for the archive center, it's just another document, you know, and people come into the ar these archive centers photographing, you know, birth certificates, marriage certificates, all, all, all sorts of, um, in, well, not ancient documents, but old documents from, like, you know, early Victorian times. And, you know, as long as you didn't use flash photography, they were, they were perfectly happy about it. Um, they would even photocopy uh, things for you if, <laughs> if you wanted, you know. So I was um, pleasantly surprised at that. Um, and it certainly made um, a difference to the research being able to uh, copy or to photograph these um, documents because you can zoom in. You can do stuff with the photograph that you simply can't do with a, a photocopy of the, the document. Now, um the uh, the ability to read his handwriting did you get better and better at that because I tried to read it too and I could I could see the frustration there but were you able to just acclimate yourself to that and and start to read it uh, in real time I can read it now fairly well right but at the beginning Jimmy it was an absolute nightmare as you say yourself some of the the handwriting is is published in the book and it is Excribble, you know, it's just so, so difficult um, to read. But what helped, obviously, was that this was um, his journal, his private journal, which he based to write, was the basis for which to write his published book. So I was able to go to the date in his journal and the date in his book and to try and cross-reference. And I could pick out words. Ah, all right, yeah, that that's that word there, block, granite, you know, and I could see how he would write the word granite and how he'd write the word block, you know. And I just worked basically from, from that premise. It, it was slow, it took a lot of time, but it was worth it in the end because I, I can now read his handwriting reasonably well. Um, some some pages are still quite difficult, but you know, overall, I managed to put it this way, Jimmy. I managed to get um, some real important stuff out of that journal, which is not in his published account for very obvious reasons. Do you think um, Raven and Hill, you know, his two partners in crime, if you will? Uh, going back to uh, Mancare and that pyramid, do you think Raven and Hill also were part of that hoax? Um, part of the at Mancare, the Mancare, the Mancare yeah. hoax. Yes, yes, I think so. Yeah, um, definitely. I think these. I think Vice Hill and Raven. That was the team. The three of them um, were involved. I think in just about everything at Giza, and you know, there's obviously uh, other evidence that implicates um, Raven and Hill, and obviously Vice himself, in, in all of this. Now, uh, uh, as you're doing your investigation and you're looking in uh, Vice's journal, one of the things that you point out in this book, uh, which is meticulous on your part, I mean, it's so well laid out, um, is is Vice trying to figure out how to do Khufu's cartouche. And because back, we have to go back to 1837, there were only a couple of experts in the world, and that was back in London, he's in Cairo, um, that could lay out any of this, right? And he needed to figure, because if he's going to hoax this, he's got to have Khufu's cartouche correct, 
and he in his published journals uh it was all simple but in his private journals he's trying to work this out himself and as you were laying eyes on this were you just like holy crap man this this guy is just full of doo doo because here he is trying to figure out how to, how to do this correctly yeah you see this um um in vice's journal this is one of the things that was was really quite ironic jimmy and actually discovering vice's private journal and reading reading those pages i at the beginning i couldn't read I could barely read a single word on the page, but the one thing I could make out and could read very easily were the hieroglyphics that Vice had drawn on these pages. And there was the the, the Khufu cartouche in a number of these um, pages. And you could see um, that he, he discovered uh, a cartouche originally initially with a, a circle, as one of the signs in the cartouche of Khufu is a circle. And initially... You see him drawing it in his diary with with no lines in the circle. There's normally three lines, three horizontal lines, stacked lines in the circle. And initially in Vice's private journal, there are no lines in the circle. And you have to ask yourself the question, well, you know, why, if he's copying this from something that is already there, why is he missing out these lines? in this circle and that is that is a a key question <laughs> in the book because under the, one of the other signs in the khufu cartouche name is a small snake and under the snake there's two tiny dots you can see these dots in the cartouche in the chamber today and vice drew those two tiny dots they're much smaller than these three lines he misses out the three lines but draws these two tiny dots why? Why would he draw something so small and miss out something so large? And, you know, if he is meticulously copying and says this in his book, his published account, he meticulously, you know, examined the chamber and copied the marks. So why did he miss out? On two occasions in his private journal, he missed out these lines in this circle. And obviously I explain the reason why in the book. And then eventually he finds... Um, another Khufu cartouche, or rather Mr. Perring, another one of his assistants, you know, tells him of a cartouche in a tomb to the west of the Great Pyramid that's got the Khufu cartouche, and he finds that this cartouche has got lines inside it, inside the circle. And uh, you can see Vice going back to his journal and making that correction. Yeah, and also, I don't want to get too technical here, but most cartouches are vertical. He's trying to figure out a horizontal cartouche, too. And all criminals, all hoaxes, right? You're going to get caught, and you're going to make mistakes. And that was that was his downfall, well, aside from admitting to it later, and we'll get to that. Uh, but I want to talk uh, here. We, we have to talk about Hill's facsimiles. They didn't have cameras back then. So what they had to do uh, with anything uh, in discovery back then, you had an artist with you, you had somebody with you that would document everything exactly as you saw it, and they were shipping this stuff back to London to get confirmation on it. His guy was his partner in crime, Hill, who was going in and making drawings, uh, allegedly, of exactly what they were finding there. What evidence of forgery did, did this offer to you? Well, there's a couple of things um, here, Jimmy. About, go to the first chamber that um, Vice broke into or blasted his way into, Wellington's chamber. This is the one directly above Davison's chamber. Now, inside that chamber, when Vice blasted into it, he finds nothing. Okay, and then he goes up on a second visit. I think this was on the 27th of March, 1837. He's with... Um, um, I think it's Hill and Mash, um, two 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 other guys, were in this chamber, and then he right he finds some um, painted marks, like the strange symbols, strange geometric symbols painted onto the wall near to the entrance that they broke broke through, and but Vice writes and he found these strange marks, these geometric symbols, but then he writes but nothing like hieroglyphics. 
Now, hieroglyphics devices are these quarry marks which he, he, he would have been familiar with, which he would have seen elsewhere. So hieroglyphics and quarry marks are synonymous um, with Vice, okay? So when Vice writes in Wellington's chamber, he found nothing like hieroglyphics, okay? Remember, he's looking for a cartouche. This is what he's desperate to find, and he says there's nothing there, okay? In his published book, Jimmy, on this very same night, in the very same chamber, Wellington's chamber, on the same night, he writes in his published account, we found the quarry marks. So there you have right away a major contradiction from his private thoughts in his private journal to his public account and his published book. Major contradiction. And when you look, you go and look and find out, well, what quarry marks did he find in Wellington's chamber where he originally says in his private journal there were no marks? You find it was a cartouche and it was painted by Mr. Hill. So that's that's your first um, clue there that, you know, this just doesn't smell right at all. There's something going on here. But there's another issue with the the major issue with the drawings made by Hill, and it's to do with Mr. Hill using his signature. Remember I explained earlier, Jimmy, that these marks, these quarry marks, there are the orientations of them on the walls of these chambers are some of them are sideways, some of them are upside down, some of them few of them are the right way up. So Mr. Hill needed to find a way to tell the people back in London how each group of these marks were oriented. You know, if you give a person standing in the chamber looking at these marks, had they're upside down, Mr Hill wanted to make sure that the people in London knew which way around these particular set of marks were oriented. Okay? So he used his signature as a sort of like a compass. Right. A, a this way up sign which when you're reading his, his signature the correct way, it would orientate the marks to the way they appeared in the chamber, okay? Well, we, we, have to, we have to take a break right here, so let's yep. do that, and we'll pick this up right when we come back. This is Fade to Black, our guest tonight, Scott Creighton, his book, The Great Pyramid Hoax. I'm your host, I almost said, I'm your hoax, Jimmy Church. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back. KGRA Radio. Intelligent Talk. You've probably heard about all the great benefits of goat milk soap. But did you know, some companies take shortcuts. At Old New England Soap, we make our organic goat's milk soap using 36% goat's milk. That's 17% more than most others. Our bars are larger, so they last longer, producing lots of lather packed with vitamins. And our soap is a natural moisturizer that smooths dry and damaged skin. Order online at oldnesoap.com. That's oldnesoap.com. You've tried the rest. Now try the best. Oldnesoap.com. Water-based soaps on supermarket shelves use harsh chemical acids to break down dead skin cells. And that's just not good for you. At Old New England Soap, our soaps are made without chemical ingredients, contain no alcohol or petroleum products, and use 85% organic materials and carry the USDA's organic certification. Try some today. Go to oldnesoap.com. That's oldnesoap.com. Oldnesoap.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on the smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. 
If you have sciatica, then you know all about the crippling pain that travels from your lower back down your leg when a spasm occurs. It's brutal. In fact, it's enough to take your breath away. Dr. Zhang's sciatica nerve cream helps relieve persistent, shooting pains associated with the sciatic nerve in the lower back and legs. This natural, homeopathic cream contains the most potent ingredients to soothe even the most excruciating pain associated with sciatica. Stop the pain now. Ask for Dr. Zhang's sciatica nerve cream at your local health food store or go online to trasknutrition.com. Would you like relief from muscle pain, headaches, and discomfort to sleep better, have more energy during the day, and just feel naturally amazing? Fibromalic can help. Its blend of malic acid and magnesium can provide pain relief and comfort for those who experience fibromyalgia. It helps your body absorb more oxygen, and it works quickly for a significant reduction in pain within 48 hours, all without a prescription. Ask for Fibromalic at health and vitamin shops or shop Fibromalic.com. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. On the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. You can follow me on Twitter right now. Twitter is hot right now at J Church Radio. That's what you want to do. Hashtag F2BQ for any questions or comments for myself or Scott. And this portion of Fade to Black is brought to you by our sponsor, River Moon Coffee. Makers of the Fade to Black blend. Yeah, that's right. It's dark, complex, and smoky. Just go to River Moon Coffee right now. The banner is over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Use the promo code F2BBLEND. And you will get 15% off of your order. All right. So, Scott, this is okay. We've got a lot of, I want to take some phone calls here tonight, too, as well. So, we'll set that up at the top of the hour. But uh, we've got a few important points that I want to go through here. And the first thing I want to say is this when I, I watched the, the famous video of Zahi, you know, climbing up into Davidson's chamber and, and he points down, you know, with the camera, that right there is proof that this was Khufu's tomb. And I look, and I was just like, wait a minute. You're writing everything, all of history, on that, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's, that just doesn't look right to me. I need some papyrus. I need some, uh, I need some carvings. I need some description, you know, but to put, to rest everything, all of world history, on that, that doesn't look real to me, is a stretch. And as it turns out, He's wrong. Now, there was some uh, testing done on the gang symbols. And there was one point that uh, almost uh, got by me in your book. And you said that there were also some samples of iron that were, that were found on the surface of the... How is that possible that there could be iron there when it's 2,000 years before the Iron Age, right? We're, we're dealing with, with copper here. Um, what, can you explain that to me and how, how iron was detected on the surface of these blocks? Well, this is um, part of the research of um, the two German uh, university graduates, um, Dominic Gorlitz and Stefan Erdmann. Uh, they, I think it was April 2013, they were 
they had a permit to visit these chambers and they took a sample of the paint um, from uh, one of the chambers and I have to say it wasn't the cartouche. You know, there was a total media circus about this event uh, happening in 2013, you know, claiming all sorts of um, hyper that they stole the cartouche. It wasn't. They took a small sample of ochre paint from a, a, a corner of the chamber of a much less significant sign. Anyway, they wanted to get that carbon dated. But part of their other research was that there were, there were, there's these um, curious marks on the, the ceiling, the roof of the king's chamber, there are small sort of um, vertical, um, or sorry, rectangular shaped marks on the roof of the chamber at regular intervals. And these these marks, go, you know, they go behind the wall of the, the chamber, the, you know, they the, the get deep into you know, the gap, um, up, you know, where the, the wall meets the, the ceiling. So their, their original, um, whatever these markings are, to the construction of the, the chamber. And Dominic Gorlitz, um, he had he took a scraping of um, these marks, of the material, whatever it was, and he found um, it was basically iron or s some magnetite. Um, and <laughs> he's come, he has come to the conclusion that the ancient Egyptians, or whoever built these structures, used iron inside the Great Pyramid because that is what his chemical analysis has come up with of this material that was removed from the roof of or the ceiling of the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. And it's that, been analysed. Yeah, and that's exactly what Cairo didn't want to have found. Right. And and through that controversy, which uh, that's for a whole nother show, but they were they were crying. They wanted the samples back, if I remember correctly, that they stole part of it. And they did, you know, and was it because uh, the the hoax was out that uh, and they were finding things that weren't supposed to be, you know, iron, <laughs> iron uh, obviously is a game changer. Right. And yep. and if the ochre paint isn't what it was supposed to be and it was in the wrong spot and, and had other issues with it, well, then that strikes down everything. And is that why that they were crying foul with the Germans at that time? Yeah, I think there's there's, there's a lot of politics involved in this, Jimmy, as you probably know. You know, that analysis made by... Um, Dominic Gorlitz, you know that that is a major game changer in its in its own right. That he has found these markings contain iron. You know, um, there's also, if you remember, there was an iron door found at the exit of the shaft from the king's chamber. Um, you know, there's these small channels which go through the body of the pyramid from the chamber to the outside of the pyramid. And Vice and his team found the, uh, the exit of this small channel and it was sealed by an iron door. Um, you know, so it's like, and it was, well, according to Vice and Hill, I can't see any reason why they would particularly want to fake something like that. It was embedded into the stonework, so it was obviously original. They had to blast it out of the stonework, you know. So they found this iron door, you know, blocking this shaft. So whoever built this structure was using iron, you know. So there we have it. You know, it's just a mystery. How? Well, to me, it's it's not really a mystery because I take a completely different view of these structures with a completely different chronology and timeline from conventional wisdom. Um, I believe the structures are way, way, way much older than we are presently being led to believe by, you know, conventional wisdom. You know, so this, you know, there's all these these anomalies the the. The paint that they took, they wanted to have that carbon dated because 
in ancient Egypt, what they would do, you cannot, I mean, ochre paint is made from iron oxide and water, that's all it is, but sometimes what they would do is they would put in gum or oil, fish oil or honey or whatever to act as a binding agent. Now, obviously, these are organic materials which can then carbon date. That was the hope when they took this um, this small sample of ochre paint from the sign. Right. Um, but when they, they got it back to the, the, the lab and had it analysed, there wasn't enough organic material in the ochre paint, to, so the, the it couldn't be tested. There just wasn't enough uh, carbon datable material in the, the sample that they took. But in saying that, there's these unintended, unintended consequences. Um, their analysis found something else much more important that actually does prove that these marks um, um, were, were faked. And what is that? Well, oh, the you sample... Know what? Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead, continue. I've got something else I've got to get in here. Go ahead. Yeah, the sample that the took, um, Jimmy, we were talking earlier about this plaster on the walls that they would slide through um, the, the blocks through how come you know the, the these marks aren't smeared with this plaster well it's always it always been argued by orthodox Egyptology that there's no plaster on the walls it's white Tura limestone well how would you how would you know plaster on a white block you know if the plaster's white you know anyway they tested the the rock that the paint had been painted onto and it came back as calcium sulfate as opposed to calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is limestone. Calcium sulfate is plaster. These signs have been painted onto plaster. So that means, now, you don't you don't put plaster on the block until the block is in situ, until the block, you know, is in place. You know, if you're moving this block, you know, 20 miles or 100 or 500 miles, whatever, you're not going to put plaster on. You're going to do the plaster's a finishing job, yeah? Yeah. So the plaster's done in situ. So how, that means these signs then were done in situ because you wait till the plaster's dry and then you put this, the you paint the sign on the dried plaster. So why did the scribe paint the signs upside down? The, uh, the point that I think is most dramatic here is we are dealing with, um, allegedly, the the fourth dynasty. And if we remove Khufu and the fourth dynasty, because we don't know anything about the Great Pyramid. We know nothing. The only thing we have is, are these uh, hoaxed gang symbols in the Khufu cartouche. But if those are removed from the mix and it is no longer fourth dynasty, then... We are back to ground zero. We're back to knowing absolutely nothing about the Great Pyramid. And if that is the case, and we take Fourth Dynasty out of the mix, and Fourth Dynasty is old. I mean, we're talking old. And if we take the Fourth Dynasty out of the mix, that means the pyramids were sitting there at Dynasty Zero. Right? They were already there, and it truly rewrites history. We don't know about the age. We're going to talk about that in a second. But that's what is happening here, isn't it, Scott? We now know nothing, and the pyramids were clearly sitting there already during the Fourth Dynasty. Yeah. These marks, Jimmy, these marks are so crucial to the orthodox narrative. These marks represent their holy grail of evidence that this structure was built by Khufu as his tomb. And ergo, its date, because they know when Khufu lived, is 2550 BC. The, their whole timeline, their whole chronology hinges on these marks. Now, if these marks are shown to be fake and we remove them from evidence, then, as you say, you know, we, we wipe the slate clean. We're back to hearsay of right. where we were nearly 200 years ago. Um, you know, that that's where we have to go back to to continue the conversation from where Vice's actions effectively derailed the study of these structures. You know, it took it down a cul-de-sac for the best part of 200 years, and we have to come back out of that cul-de-sac and look at the question afresh. 
will you do me a favor right now? Say Holy Grail for me one more time. Holy Grail. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I mean, no disrespect, but man, your accent is just, it's, it's, it's perfect. Absolutely perfect. Somebody else Jimmy, just tweeted. Jimmy, Jimmy, Some... to me, I'm your hoax. <laughs> yeah, right. You see, somebody just tweeted, he's got to say Rolling Hills of Scotland for us, please. <laughs> Rolling Hills of Scotland. That's what I'm talking about. Um, the it is, it is an absolute game changer. Because if that is indeed the case, and you're absolutely right, everything rests on these hoaxed symbols. So if we take that out of the mix, that means Fourth Dynasty isn't there. We're back to ground zero, and we don't know nothing. And it's it's a crucial point to make, and nobody wants to step up and admit this. They're so ingrained in this, a 200-year-old hoax, that they, they can't go backwards. They, they simply can't, can they? No. As I said, uh, this, you know, the... the there's so many books that would have to be rewritten. There's so many reputations that would be on the line. You know, they've they've all bought into this narrative. But as I said, Jimmy, I do believe that they know that these marks are fake. They're just not saying it. They're just not telling us. But I do genuinely genuinely believe that they, the authorities, the powers that be in Egypt know. They have to know because they're st- there's such glaringly obvious signs which should show them that these marks aren't right for this period. There's anachronistic signs in there. They're written with the wrong orientation. They didn't do horizontal writing in the Fourth Dynasty. It was vertical writing. You know, so there's all this glaringly obvious stuff that they must know. Right. It's just wrong. Right, right. And now let's uh, let's get to one of the most important parts of the book. And uh, the whole book is important, by the way. Um, but that's that that one line in Vice's journal where he literally says, I'm paraphrasing here. I'm going to have you talk about it. But he literally says, OK, guys, get up into the chamber and start painting. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, I mean, it's what did what went through your mind, Scott, when you read that? Well, when I, I read it initially, Jimmy, I, I was trying to figure out what, what's he actually talking about here? Um you know what? 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 Can, he draws this. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll let the readers. Uh, sorry, the listeners um, uh, hear this. He writes for Raven and Hill. You know, this is this is like he's writing. He's making a note to himself. You know, he's going back to his journal at the end of a day. He's going back to his tent, to his desk with the oil lamp on his desk and his journal at night, writing of the day's events. So he's writing a note for himself for Raven and Hill. These are the these are the marks, um, uh, and then he draws a picture of the the, the marks, f- um, a cartouche, to inscribe um, on any plain um, low trussing. Now a trussing is a, a diagonal uh, or a triangular support, a roof trussing, and that's exactly the the type of um, roof that we have in Campbell's chamber, where we find this particular um, cartouche. So he draws this cartouche in his diary, and he says, for Hill and Raven, um, you know, basically this is the the cartouche that I would like to be placed on a plain low trussing. And it can't be any more clear. Why didn't he burn this journal? Why didn't he throw it in the fireplace? I mean, it's so clear and so obvious. Did he not care about the future? Did he not care about getting discovered? Uh, He was so meticulous about everything else, but this was a glaring mistake. Well, have you ever burned any of your diaries? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I have (laughs) none. I I, I keep my diaries, you know. They're personal. You know, there's a a lot of stuff in there that um, has a lot of um, personal value to me. Um, You know, so... I think you know he he would be attached to these these pages because they're you know represent a special time in his life 
you know, when he was doing this stuff um, at at Giza. Plus, we have to remember as well, um, you know, this this <laughs> but this was eighteen thirty seven. Vice is thinking no one else is ever going to look at these pages over and above which his, his writing is extremely difficult anyway. But, you know, this is 1837. You know, you have to... He had no idea of electricity, of cameras, you know... Carbon video cameras. dating, sure, Different sure. world. Right, right, right. And over and above which, maybe he was planning and burning this particular... Um, page or died or whatever, but he died the day before he did it. You know, we just don't know. But whatever reason is, fortunately, it, those pages are still here, and anyone can go and look at them for themselves. And and uh, once you start to you, you read that passage, right, where he literally instructs uh, Raven and Hill to go willy nilly, right, <laughs> just go and get get the painting done. Um, but when you look at that and then you look at all the other evidence in the book and its totality, he, he, he was guilty from the word go. It wasn't one little thing. You start to add it up and then you read that one thing and it's just like, d- d- dude, hoaxed us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's the eyewitness account as well. You know, <laughs> there's a guy that, you know, uh, that saw it happening, and that story has come down to us as well. And that was one of the things that um, Zechariah um, published, I think it was um, 2007. That was one of the major pieces of evidence that Zechariah brought forward. And that was just poo-pooed and discounted um, out of hand because of some of the mistakes that Zechariah had made with some of his other evidence. But, you know, it's like... The establishment, the, the academics, they, they throw everything out. Oh, you make one mistake, they throw everything out. I will just dismiss you entirely. No, that's wrong. You know, second I brought forward some really good stuff, some really good evidence. But because of a couple of things that he got wrong, and no one is denying that, everyone just, you know, or the academics just throw the whole lot out. And that, to me, is just wrong. So there was these eyewitnesses, or, or sorry, this eyewitness that saw Raven and Hill do this, and he had an argument with him, and they had a fight with Vice about this, you know, so that's all documented as well. You know, it's just incredible that, to me now, Jimmy, looking at all this, and probably to you as well, reading this book and all the evidence, and all the things that these guys actually got wrong in making this hoax, that anybody could actually b- believe that these marks today are genuine. It's just incredible that anyone anyone could now believe that these marks are genuine now we're gonna head to a break here when, when we come back uh, we're gonna open up the phone lines but one of the crucial questions i have here is probably going to come up in the phone calls too as well is if it wasn't the egyptians it wasn't the fourth dynasty third second first dynasty zero who built the pyramids are you asking me this right now? Yeah, <laughs> we a, could be here all night, Jimmy. And, and we'll we will discuss <laughs> we could, this well, absolutely. My own, yeah. My own view is um, it goes. Very, I have to go with the evidence on this. Okay, that's what I've done in this book, and that's what I always do. I talk about this in my previous book, Jimmy, the Secret Chamber of Osiris, the Lost Knowledge of the Sixteen Pyramids. Mm-hmm. And in that book, you know, we, we are told by the ancient Egyptians themselves that their civilization is 40,000 years old. Right. Now, that's ignored. That's ignored by Orthodox Egyptology. But I looked at that and thought, well, OK, let's run with it. Let's see where this takes us. And it makes a lot of sense. And it explains, you know, that there once was an, a very ancient Egyptian civilization, the progenitor civilization of Egypt, if we could call it that, that, in my opinion, created these these monuments. And they were doing so for a, for a very specific reason, that, you know, they were, they were anticipating the end of their kingdom. And this is what these pyramids were all, were all about, to preserve the remnant of their civilization so that it could rise like a phoenix um, out of the ashes and rebuild itself. It could be reborn. You know, so I explain all that in, in my previous book. So we're talking about, you know, a civilization that goes back not 4,000 years or 5,000 years, but 40,000 years. And it's been lost in the mists of time. And, you know, we're just, 
we've been derailed, as I said, for the last 200 years by this, these quarry marks locking the pyramid date to Khufu, ergo, to four and a half thousand years ago. We remove that, we can get back to where the discussion was almost 200 years ago and take it up from that point. You know, because there were people back then, 200 years ago, you know, contemplating that the pyramids, well, they could have been built before the flood. You know, they're talking about the biblical flood. Right. You know, there was this discussion, you know, there were antediluvian, you know, structures and so forth. You know, so that ended. These quarry marks discovered, allegedly by Vice, ended that discussion. And, you know, that was it. You know. Well, I, I, I'll tell you something else, Scott. And this is this is this is the truth. This is a fact. If it was Pharaoh Crichton, right, <laughs> and that was your pyramid, you are not painting something up, you know, where nobody can see it. You're going to put Crichton in big engraved letters over the entrance, and you're going to make it 50 yards wide, you know, 50 cubits wide, <laughs> 20 cubits tall, and you're going to put your name on it for everybody to know. You're not going to paint it up in the attic on the side of a truss. That's not how it's going to happen, and that's it. I'm just calling it how it should be. Yeah, I mean, these quarry marks, they're unofficial. They're the, the quarry gang's stamps, if you like, they're, they're not supposed to be there as such, okay? There are no official inscriptions anywhere inside the Great Pyramid, anywhere inside these early giant pyramids at all, anywhere, None, they're completely anonymous. And these are the only writing that has ever been found or identified as Egyptian writing that's ever been found anywhere in these pyramids. You know, so if Khufu was some egomaniac, as you know, some people suggest, building this massive tomb to himself, well, why didn't he put his name, you know, in letters, you know, twenty feet tall all over that structure? You know. That's what an eagle mean. Why aren't there, you know, statues of Khufu, you know, lined up in the Grand Gallery or painted on the walls all over, you know, those chambers in the Great Pyramid, you know, 20 feet tall statues or paintings of Khufu? There's nothing. Yeah, There's that's right. Well, nothing. They did it. They did it all over Egypt, right? Any, any, any other uh, 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 temple in Egypt. You know what it's what's going on there everywhere except for on the Giza Plateau, which includes the Sphinx. All right, let's take a break right here, Scott. If you're on hold, we'll take your calls next. You stay right there, 323-825-5045. Our guest tonight, Scott Creighton, his book, The Great Pyramid Hoax. I'll be right back. Listen to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Balance of Nature's Fruits and Veggies. I had gout in both my knees, and it's gone. Uh, well, I'm pretty stupid. I should have ordered it, like, you know, 15 years ago. Best really? thing I ever got in my... It's, it's the most effective product that I've ever bought in my life. He had eczema on his hand, and it cracked and it cracked for years. Mm -hmm. He did anything from doctor, every cream, everything. And three months on the veggies and fruit, it was gone. They're just awesome. They keep asking me, what am I doing? I told them what I did with my cholesterol. I had the blood test, right? And it went down 100 points. 262, now it's 162. Everything is just perfect. Call now to find out how to get your free month's supply of Balance of Nature. Call 800-2468-751. That's 800-2468-751. Call now, 800-2468-751. Or go online to balanceofnature.com. Use promo code TSL. 
Would odors, mold, and mildew describe your basement or crawl space? It doesn't have to be that way. Transform them into a fresh, healthy, usable one with the technologically advanced Wave Moisture Control Units. The computerized operation maximizes moisture control and also expels harmful radon, combustion gases, and numerous other pollutants. Dehumidifiers are old technology that do nothing for air quality and waste energy. Wave units are intelligent, self-monitoring, do not need maintenance, and will save you hundreds in electricity. Wave units are still running a Effectively over 15 years. They've been tested and installed in public and military housing and by property managers nationwide. Buy a unit now, and if your home is not fresher and drier, you can return it for a full refund for up to 12 months. What have you got to lose? Call now. 1-888-618-WAVE. 1-888-618-WAVE. Or visit MyDryHome.com. That's MyDryHome.com. Wave Home Solutions for a healthy, comfortable home. What's up, Fader Knots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner. Go back, Lee Teppi. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. All right, welcome back. Wow, what a show tonight. I knew it was going to be like this, by the way. Scott Creighton. The book, The Great Pyramid Hoax. And I do believe this this will be a reference book uh, for college campuses for years to come. I'm telling you, Scott, uh, you've knocked one out of the park. You have a lot to be proud of here. But you are also rolling a rock uphill. Uh, how how are you dealing with the criticism right now? Yeah, there's going to be criticism. The books the books fairly new, obviously, um, Jimmy. It's only been out since uh, December, mid December, so it's still fairly new. And I think um, the proverbial has yet to hit the fan. Right. And <laughs> so I'm pretty sure, though, when it does, that um, you know I'll, I'll get a fair bit of flack. But you know. All I can say to any of my criti- critics is, well, there's the evidence. Go check it out yourself. If you can come up with a better idea, better interpretation uh, than I have of this evidence, then by all means do so. Yeah, you know? send them to me. Just send them to me. <laughs> Just forward all of the email to me. What um, what I do find interesting is that uh, when you write something like this and you know the critics are going to come at you, that you can't have mistakes. And that's that's why this book is going to stand on its own. I found myself, Scott, I'm sitting in bed reading, you know, with the, with the light on and my wife next to me. And you can ask Rita every 15 minutes. I was like, holy crap, you've got to be <laughs> kidding me. Holy crap. You know, and I, I will put the book down and and think to myself how heavy and what the implications are. And and that's that's what this book does. And I'm serious. You have a lot to be proud of. But also, you know, you have to brace yourself because they're going to come at you. You are going straight after uh, uh, the the um, uh, the the academia 
that has been strident on this dogma for forever. You know, and that's you you you've your laser pointed focused on them and they are they they're gonna fight this. They're not gonna take it uh lying down. Let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Scott Creighton. You're live. Three, two, one. Ah, see, you know, it's funny. You leave somebody on hold for too long and they're off getting coffee, you know, <laughs> going to the I'm bathroom. Falling off the couch. Yeah, yeah the, and the, they're going to hear the time delay, right? It's going to be planned. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. They're going to race to the phones. 323-825-5045. 323-825-5045. Um, we need to talk about the Sphinx. Um, who... Okay, well, no, let's let's deal with that. And what do you think the aging is of the Sphinx? And, of course, the recarving of the head. Now whose face is that? <laughs> well, yeah, there's all sorts of uh, controversies um, surrounding the Sphinx, whether the head was originally, you know, the, obviously the body is, is that of a lion, but whether the head originally itself was also that of a lion, um, because obviously the head is, you know, relatively smaller the, you know, than it should be for the body. You know, so it begs the question, well, was the head originally much larger, uh, you know, as a, a lion's head, and has it been made smaller by subsequent, you know, recarving of the, the head over time? So, yeah, there's, there's, um, there's questions there. Personally, I think the Sphinx is contemporary with um, the pyramids. I think it's all part of a single unified plan. I explain why that is. In fact, um, if your listeners are listening, they can go onto YouTube and explain how this plan all works together. Basically, what it, Giza, part of the, the purpose of Giza is to represent our star clock. It basically tells us you know, when the design was created, when the pyramids were built. It dates the structures there, and um, go onto YouTube and just type in uh, Giza Star Clock, three words, Giza Star Star Clock, and you'll find a small video there, it's about two minutes long, it explains how, you know, this, um, the structures at Giza, which includes the Sphinx, all works as a perfect star clock, and it points to the date of 20,000 years ago. And the Sphinx included. So, are you dating the Sphinx? You know, Shock was, uh, uh, and John Anthony West. Well, and you know, Graham Hancock and Robert Baval have all talked about this ten thousand five hundred uh, BC number. But are you suggesting that the Sphinx and and uh, goes back another ten thousand years? Yep, absolutely. And there's no doubt in my mind about that. Um, and of you know various um, reasons um, for saying that, which, as I said, you know, we could be talking all night about this, but it's, it's explained in the, the previous book, um, The Secret Chamber of Osiris. But yeah, that those structures at Giza are 20,000 years old, and I'm absolutely um, convinced about that. Because remember, you know, <laughs> the Egyptians tell us themselves that their civilization was 40,000 years old. Right. You know, it's... So this is, you know, like the midpoint of, um, you know, their or the very ancient Egyptian civilization, um, which obviously um, went into a period of decline because of, I, I believe, because of some natural disaster, which occurred about twenty thousand years ago, which also this same event um, caused the brought about the end of the last glacial max maximum. The ice sheets over North America and Europe went into meltdown. We still don't know the exact trigger. We think we've got some ideas about it, but we're not absolutely sure why those ice sheets went into meltdown 20,000 years ago. And to me, this whole thing is all tied together as, as, as one um, story, one cause and effect um, from what happened um, 20,000 years ago with the, the ice sheets. This civilization that existed then realized there was something wrong with the earth because this is the, the Arabic chronicles tell us this. Uh, they record the, the story of King Saurud of ancient Egypt who saw the skies, the stars and the moon and the sun, you know, they had moved 
from their normal course across the sky. And he asked his priests, what does this mean? And his astronomer priest told him, it means in 300 years there will be a great flood which will destroy the entire kingdom. And King Saurid of this very ancient Egyptian civilization said, well, we are going to build giant pyramids and inside these pyramids we are going to place everything our civilization will need to reconstitute itself after this flood has passed. And, you know, when you look at the evidence, Jimmy, you, you go to the very first pyramid, that giant pyramid that the ancient Egyptians built, the Step Pyramid at Saqqara. Right. Nine, the, the early 20th century explorer, uh, Cyril Firth, was down in the, I mean, the, the, the passageways below the Step Pyramid at Saqqara, they're kilometres long. You know, they're absolutely enormous. And he was walking through these passages, you know, almost up to his knees in grain. Interesting. You know, walking, right, Walking right. through passages of grain. He found 40,000 vessels underneath that pyramid, you know, um, for for grain storage and also, not just grain, but all sorts of other seed types as well. Right. You know, so this is what they were doing. You know, they were preparing for a, a, a natural disaster. And this is, you know, the, what the evidence the actual physical evidence points to. Uh, I want to get to a couple of other points really quick. I want to be clear on the, uh, the faked uh, uh, cartouche uh, Khufu and the gang symbols. Were these written incorrectly from left to right or right to left, or were they depicted correctly? Well, these marks, the cartouches, um, if you, if you read them properly, They've been written, uh, when I say properly, I mean um, that the characters are the right way up. They've been written horizontally. And in the fourth dynasty, they weren't right, you know, this particular script wasn't written horizontal. It's called hieratic script. Hieratic script is essentially painted hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics were mainly, or we call them hieroglyphics, they're carved monumental, they're carved into stonework, whereas hieratic is a painted or, or written form of hieroglyphics, okay? So this hieratic script, it's a shorthand for hieroglyphics. They would um, write them, you know, on paper using ink or whatever, or papyrus, sorry. But they would, in the fourth dynasty, they would write them vertically. The text would be written vertically. But all these quarry marks in these chambers were all written horizontally and they didn't start writing horizontally hieratic script until much later dynasties, till about the 11th dynasty, they started writing horizontal hieratic script. So why do we find 11th dynasty script in a 4th dynasty structure? You know, this is what I said earlier in the show, Jimmy, that is so glaringly obvious. Mm -hmm. You know, that the, the powers that be must know that they, they simply must know that now you know the, and also um i wanted to be clear on this that style of writing evolved over a thousand years and it got sloppier and e and, you know sloppier is not the right word but it wasn't the beautiful stuff that was done uh in the fourth dynasty and and it it turned into sloppiness well that sloppiness is represented here, supposed to uh, uh, have been done during the Fourth Dynasty, which was an impossibility. That style of writing evolved over a thousand years. Well, that's right. Hieratic um, script basically started off as just painted versions of the hieroglyphics, the actual hieroglyphics. Um, the hieroglyphic, sculpted hieroglyphics didn't change over the entire 3,000, 3,500 year history of ancient Egypt. It didn't change. But the hieratic script, the shorthand of the shorthand, hieroglyphics, right. that evolved over time. It became simplified in order to write it quicker. And over time, you can see the signs gradually changing, evolving into other signs, becoming ever more simplified 
to make it quicker and quicker to write and eventually becoming what's called demotic script, which is basically the script before it changes into what we call today Arabic script. You know, so that is how, you know, over 3,000 years, you know, the, the hieroglyphics of the hieratic text evolved. And what we find also in these horizontally um, written, written hieratic cartouches is that, or gang names is there are signs in those names which also come from much, you know, they're much later evolved signs. You know, these signs weren't actually used in the Fourth Dynasty. They were, they were actually evolved much later. So what it looks to me has been happening, Jimmy, is that there was possibly some reconstruction um, project at Giza or repair project at Giza in some later dynasties, maybe the 12th or 13th dynasty, something like that. And it was the gang names from that time that um, Vice, in his ignorance, copied into these um, chambers. He made a big mistake there. He is thinking, well, he in his ignorance, he's totally ignorant. And in fact, most of Egyptology at that time was fairly, you know, it was in its infancy at that time, our understanding of it. But we now know um, from having nearly 200 years of study, you know, what happened when and when each of these signs evolved. Vice wouldn't have known that. He thought it was all just the same. And why, he just copied it into these chambers. Right. And why do you think, Scott, uh, throughout uh, all of your research, why... Why suppress the truth? What is it that they are actually hiding here? They're hiding something, but why suppress the truth? Well, if 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 the truth is just really simple, it wasn't Khufu. We don't know, but but why hide the truth? Well, I think um, probably one of the reasons is because nobody's challenged it. To be honest, Zechariah made an attempt at it. Um, and obviously he got some things wrong there and was um, basically dismissed. You know, but since then, that's, that was almost 40 years ago and nothing has been done since. So I think that's part of the reason is because no one's really looked at it closely. Nobody's really challenged it. Well, this book is the first to do that. And I sincerely hope that Egyptology does look at this book and does consider what it's saying and does reassess, you know, um, its position with regard to these particular marks. Now, I'm, I'm happy, um, Jimmy, to, to be shown that I'm wrong. I won't be wrong about everything. I may be wrong about a small detail here or there. I accept that. But there's a lot in that book that I am absolutely bang on the money about. And, um, you know, it would be interesting to see how Egyptology approaches this because it's never been done before. And this is the first book that has basically laid down the gauntlet to Egyptology to have a revisit of these marks because it was too easy for them in the past. Nobody, and also the other thing as well to remember is that this had to be done by someone outside the discipline. This was never going to be done by someone within the academic um, Egyptology circles because it's more than their job's worth. I said that earlier in the show. Um, you know, if, if they start rocking the boat, you know, they could lose research grants. Um, they, they might lose research permits. You know, they won't be allowed to go to particular sites in Egypt. You know, so there's a lot riding on you know, people within the dis the discipline just basically keeping stum about this stuff. Tourism dollars. There's one. There's one example right there. The yeah. um, the uh, okay. Uh, the 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 one of the most crucial things when it comes to Giza and the dating of all of this is I depend on my eyes. Right. I look at the pyramids. I look at the Sphinx and I am sure that they haven't changed in 2000 years. They have not changed. They look exactly the same, which probably means that they look the same 2000 years before that. They haven't aged. They haven't they haven't they haven't changed at all. 
which means that they are really, 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 really bleeping old. And if that is the case, then probably what they're trying to suppress here or keep from us is the fact that civilization goes way beyond 3000 BC. It goes way beyond Mesopotamia. It goes way beyond Dynasty Zero. And they don't want that knowledge to get out here because if it starts to leak out, then they have some explaining to do. Yeah, absolutely. They do not want the conventional timeline challenged. That you, you're absolutely right in, in saying that. That's that's my view as well. And you know, when you start, um, you know, pulling, you know, um, you know, bricks out of the the wall, as it were, you know, that basically eventually destabilizes um, the entire edifice. You know, they're, they're, they're basically trying to keep that wall up by, you know, suppressing and denying, um, you know, this information. You know, so this and this book, you know, this, um, it shows categorically that, you know, well, we've got to go back to basics with um the great, well, with these pyramids at Giza, we've just got to go back to basics here because these marks can no longer lock these structures to 2550 BC. It can't because those marks that did that are fake. Right. So we have to go back to basics. We have to get Egyptology to reassess this, to look at it with different eyes, uh, you know, using modern science, get modern science into these. Um, you know, pyramids and start analysing uh, these things properly and stop being scared about, you know, changing the paradigm. You know, we're all grown-ups here. You know, if, if it turns out that, you know, um, the pyramids were built, you know, 10,000 years before Gobekli Tepe, right. you, know, you know, it's like up until what very recently, probably in the last five, ten years, you know, it was generally accepted that civilization began what around six thousand years ago. We began, beco- you know, becoming. Um, um, we stopped being hunter gatherers and started farming and so forth and so on. You know, well, what if that actually happened much earlier at Gobekli Tepe? You know, there's there's a, a, a temple. You know, with incredible artwork, which we apparently weren't supposed to be doing twelve thousand years ago. You know, but there you are. It's there. It's in your face. You can see it. You know, so that proves that. Well, we need to reassess this here. But what if that Gobekli Tepe is just scratching the surface? That's exactly you know, right. If, but that's exactly you know, the point, though, Scott. That's exactly it. Gobekli Tepe wasn't supposed to exist, right? And it does. <laughs> and now, now they have to, they have some explaining to do. I mean, that's a seven thousand year gap. From the number that they gave us, they are saying the Great Pyramid is 2650 B.C. That's their number and that everything started right then. And then here we have Gobekli Tepe and and 10,000 B.C., right? 12,000 years old. It's not supposed to exist. And that is their problem. And they can't explain it. Exactly. You know, so when we we start finding, it's almost like, you know, Jimmy, the, the... the deeper we dig, you know, the further <laughs> we are pushing the boundaries know, of right? civilization. Right, right. Well, let me ask you that. I ask every guest this question, um, so I'm going to ask it of you. Uh, I've done this now 600 times. You'll be 601. <laughs> if you could jump into a time machine, me, I've answered this so many times. Me, I'm going to Giza. I'm not going to... The crucifixion. I'm not going to do any of that. I, no, I'm going to see how the pyramid, the Great Pyramid, was built. If you could jump in that time machine, where would you go? <laughs> that's that's actually an easy one um, for me, Jimmy. Um, I would go to uh, back in time. I would go to 48 BC um, to the library at Alexandria. Oh, so, good. Good and call, I would, Scott. Good call. <laughs> and I would have a big, as many buckets of water, you know, ready to douse Caesar yeah. ships before, <laughs> you know, um, you know, because just think the knowledge, you know, how the pyramids were built might have been in that library, you know, yeah, yeah. um, the amount of knowledge that, um, we lost there is just, it's just, 
You know, it's unfathomable. You know yeah, how a, much knowledge. You're you're the first person to uh, to say that. That's actually a good call. That's a that's a very good call. Um, and the uh, uh, the other question I wanted to ask you was, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what? Do you want to hang on for a little overtime? I've got to hit a break here, and I've got a couple yeah. other questions I want to uh, get out there. Okay, is this? We have so many different theories because we don't know nothing, right? We just don't uh, about the Great Pyramid. What it, what was it? A weapon? Was it a communications device? Was it a giant GPS? Was it a a, a marking spot? What you know? It, it, it so many different theories. Uh, it was an energy device. It um, and for you, what just what was the function? I, I, the one thing it wasn't was a tomb. Right, so we scratched that off the list. But what was the function of the Great Pyramid? Well, uh, obviously touched on that um, earlier, and I think um, the the story of the Great Pyramid has what it was has kind of become corrupted in time, and you know its roots, its function has become lost in time and slightly corrupted. You'll be familiar with the um, the granaries of Joseph idea. Yeah. Yes. Now, I'm not saying the pyramids were the granaries of Joseph at all. I don't believe that. Like Ben Ben Car is it Ben Carson? Yes. Yeah, Ben Carson believes that. But I think there are elements of truth there that have become corrupted. I think genuinely the story of King Saurud of very ancient, long time ago in Egypt, his idea that you know they were going to build these structures essentially as you know arcs. And they were going to store in them everything that the kingdom would need to be reborn again. That would include a lot of different seed types. There's probably, you know, no pun intended here, a big, you know, grain of truth in yeah. that story. Well, what about, uh, uh, we've got 60 seconds. What do you think about the scanning uh, pyramids project that's going on there right now? They have found some anomalies um, uh, on different sides of the pyramid. Uh, yeah. do, how many chambers do you think uh, are still left to be found? I think there's quite a bit, but what do you think? Um, well, it's, it's a difficult one. I think these may just be natural recesses. But, you know, they know about um, chambers under the Sphinx, and I've known about that for, what, 20 years now? Maybe, yeah. maybe more than that? Right. You know, and they've never told us what's there. They've never told us. So even if they do find chambers, I'm not full of hope that they will ever release what's there. Because this is the thing, Jimmy, they're scared to, re to, to release information. This is why they haven't, you know, um, the, the tomb of um, Tutankhamun, they believe Nefertiti's tomb may be behind one of the walls. And all that's suddenly disappeared and been hushed up. You know, so it's like they're almost scared to find stuff that contradicts their narrative. That's their problem. They're, they're, it's like they're almost afraid to find you know, new evidence because that new evidence might contradict their entire narrative. So it's always hushed up. And I think to a large extent, it may also be done clandestinely, you know, so that it doesn't leak out. Right. We're going to take a break right here. Thank you, Scott. We're going to do a little overtime with everybody. And if you're on hold, I'll take your calls next, too, as well. So just stay right there. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. Our guest tonight, Scott Creighton, live from Glasgow, Scotland. I'll be right back. Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. 
Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. Hi, folks. In a world of GMO, genetically modified organisms, that is, chemicals, processed foods, and a healthcare system that's unraveling like a cheap suit, it's time to prepare. God created herbs, and herbs help man. Our body can heal itself, just sometimes we need assistance. You need some help? Get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com. Our mild detox is quite powerful with its unique blend of eight different herbs. And if you're looking for more, our non GMO supplements will help you with different needs you might have. Health should be a top priority. Take care of your health naturally. Log on to get the tea. Dot com. That's get the tea dot com. Give your body a treat. Let the herbs do their thing naturally. Read all the testimonies on the website. Get the tea dot com. That's get the tea dot com. Sickness and viruses are like intruders and herbs are like warriors. Let the tea work for you. That's get the tea dot com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Chase Kletsky with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA digital broadcast station, where the fader knots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This Massey. is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Scott Creighton, his book, The Great Pyramid Hoax. We've got, Scott's going to do a little overtime with us. I've got enough time for a couple of quick phone calls, and I'm going to get all of your questions in right now to Scott directly that have been uh, sent in, and uh, so I will honor all of those. Uh, Scott, let's, uh, let's go to the phones really quick. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Scott. You're live. Hello. Yeah, you're live right now. Okay, this is Arnold from San Jose. Hi, Arnold. And my, quest, my question to Scott is uh, about the Sphinx. I was there with my wife about 11 years ago. We got a chance to see it in the enclosure with John Anthony West. And everybody says that it was originally a lion, but uh, lions have tufts on their tail. And one thing I, I noticed, there was no tuft on the tail of the Sphinx. So... Uh, that's one of the ways to tell lions from other large cats. Uh, any response to that? Um, it's it's not a particular detail that I've paid that much attention to, Arnold. Um, but you know, it's it's a perfectly you know valid point, a valid question. Um, you know, it's maybe this. You know, has it been removed or recarved or? Or you know, um, most obviously, um, people regard the Sphinx um, as a you know a feline or cat um, you know animal. You know, so uh, and we obviously we have other um, sphinxes um, throughout Egypt. Uh, obviously, you know, other than the Great Sphinx, you know, so uh, and they're obviously regarded as as lions. You know, so um, you know. Uh, yeah, that's a, you know, no, Arnold, that's a great question, by the way. And I've got sphinxes all over the bunker, right? And over at the house. Uh-huh. And I don't think there's any tufts on any of them. That's, uh, yeah, that's that's curious. But I, I, Robert Temple brought it up in his book, uh, The Mystery of the Sphinx. And it 
uh, suggesting that it could have been the head of a dog originally. But uh, yeah, I've heard that uh, too. It's definitely not, definitely not Coffrey's head. Yeah, no, you it's, look at it closely, you can see it's very, very old. Yeah, very old. So uh, all the erosion on it. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the phone call, Arnold. That That's a great, okay. great point. Thank you so much for that, my friend. Thanks. Uh, that's a that's a really great point. And I've got them all. I've never looked for that. All right. A couple of uh, questions. What does Scott know about the ancient metals that were originally on the tops of the pyramid? The ancient metals. Um, the the only metal that um, they're talking about the apex or the the Ben Ben stone on the the Great Pyramid. Um, well, there's been some theories about the Ben Ben stone or the the capstone was the that it was made of gold. But you know, again, that's that's just um, that's just a theory. It's never really been been proven. Um, metal, the only metal that I'm aware of that we, we actually know physically existed was the, the metal door that I spoke about, which was on the the, the exterior of the southern shaft of, from the, the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. And that has actually, you know, been, the, the reckon it's probably been mete- meteoric iron. Um, you know, so that's, that's the only metal that I'm, aware of that has physically been identified. Yeah, there's, um, uh, and and I'm sure the reference here from Fran is, you know, the different uh, theories of the capstones, you know, some were gems, uh, some people suggest it was gold, uh, and, and and so forth. And I think that's what the reference was there. I've, here's, uh, check this out. Um, what about uh, the supposed papyrus, uh, the diary, um, of the uh, the pyramid builder uh, during uh, the Khufu period. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, that's a, I believe that's a diary of Merer, um, who was basically a scribe, basically noting down the the number of blocks and so forth that was um, you know being sent um, to Akit Khufu, which some people believe is the name of the the Great Pyramid. Um, now we we know that um, this this could have merely have been um, for a construction job or a reconstruction job, a repair job um, at Giza. It doesn't, you know, Mera's diary doesn't say, you know, if it's for the construction, the original construction or a repair job, because we have um, the inventory stella, which basically tells us that um, Khufu made a lot of repairs to a number of. Um, monuments at Giza, including the Sphinx, by the way. Um, so why would Khufu, that's a curious one, why would Khufu be repairing the Sphinx if this, you know, if it was supposedly his son that built the Sphinx? You know, why would he be repairing something? That suggests that if he's repairing it, it must have been old or ancient even in Khufu's time. You know, so, you know, there's there's these contradictory um, texts that we have. Mera's diary, yeah, it talks about blocks being cut uh, from the Tura quarries and sent to Giza, but it could merely have been for this work that we know from the inventory stella that Khufu was repairing, you know, these other monuments, repairing monuments as opposed to building monuments at Giza. One of the things that uh, I have tried to find, and through not only through books, but through uh, museums and things with my own eyes, I've just tried to see a pyramid in any hieroglyphs anywhere right <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a curious thing you know we find that you know the ancient egyptians you know they tell us just about everything about their everyday life you know what they had for breakfast you know what beer they drank you know um when they had sex you know <laughs> they tell right. us everything about their life but the one thing they don't tell us is you know, anything about the pyramids. You know, it's just, very, very little. You know, we certainly don't know how they built them or, or anything like that. It's, it's just completely blank. You would think that it would be there. Um, now, okay, this question comes in from I, IPD, and his question is, what will happen first? Disclosure about the pyramids or disclosure about UFOs? <laughs> what do you think is going to happen first? Probably neither. Yeah. Yeah. Too easy of a question to answer. I knew you were going to yeah. go there. Um, 
Now, since the uh, uh, since the book was published, and you have to go through editing, and you write the book, and you finish it, and that's you know that's a long process. But since you've completed the book, um, have you been contacted uh, from anybody else with any evidence? Have you found or uncovered any more evidence to support the hoax? Yeah. Well, I've I've received emails from Egyptologists that say I'm right. So that's that's a good th- a, a, a good thing. Um, obviously, they want to remain anonymous, and I've got to respect that. Um, but you know, when you have a a theory or a hypothesis, Jimmy, and you test that hypothesis over time. You know, over time, if the hypothesis is correct, you generally find more and more supporting evidence popping up to support that hypothesis. If it's wrong, you generally don't find very much popping up to support that hypothesis. Now, as you know, there's an absolute ton of evidence in the book already supporting the the hypothesis of this this hoax, um, but since the book was locked down and I could I could make no more changes to it, I've actually gone on and discovered even further evidence which isn't in the book. Um, so it's an ongoing um, um, process really uh, of discovering <laughs> more and more evidence. So I don't know if it'll be a, a sequel or maybe a, an update to the book. Um, pro- probably a sequel. You know, if if I find more and more or enough evidence um, to to put together a, a, a complete book. What's next? Um, what's next? Well, next I would um, hope that Egyptology takes this book reads it and takes it seriously and considers um, its role in all of this and its responsibility in all of this. You know, um, they are the guardians of our past, of our history. And, you know, we are beholding to them to make sure that they give us the facts and give us the truth. You know, if they, as scientists, are not doing that, then they really should, you know, be considering careers and something else. You know, so Egyptology needs to take this question seriously. They need to um, look at the evidence presented and address it and get to the truth of this because this is all our history. Yeah, this is all our history at stake here. And the truth of our past is at stake here. You know, who we are as as a civilization where we come from and, you know, to some extent where we are going. So we need, you know, we need um, Egyptologists to take this matter seriously and to be open and transparent about any information or, you know, if they're going to go and do their own tests in these chambers, which I think have already been done, but if they are decide to do that, then it needs to be done in an open and transparent way so that we you know, as the as the public can see that it's being done in an open and transparent way, because at the end of the day, this is a matter of trust as well. Do you think that they will respond to this and go, okay, let's open up the upper chambers, let's go and uh, get some carbon dating done, let's do some chemical analysis, let's take some high res uh, photographs uh, and you know electron microscopes, and let's. Uh, uh, let's prove this. Let's prove Scott wrong, right? Do, <laughs> do you think that they will actually do that? I mean, because if they don't, the silence, then that means that you are right, and that's the way that I look at it. Do you think that they'll they'll accept the challenge? Well, I've I've um, laid down the gauntlet. I hope to pick it up because at the end of the day, I want the truth. That's all I want. That's all I'm interested in. Right. I believe I have uncovered a truth here, and that truth is that those marks are fake. And I think I have good, um, strong evidence um, from all different sources, you know, including eyewitnesses, chemical analysis, you know, brush stroke analysis. Um, you know, we look at the evolution of the, you know, the signs that there. Some of them are anachronistic. You know, you know. So there's a ton of evidence in that book that which says I'm right. If I've got something wrong, I'll put my hands up and say, well, fine, fair enough. But you know, they have to prove the entire book wrong, not just one or two little things in it. You know, so that's the challenge that they have got. Um, and if they can prove me right, or sorry, if they can prove me wrong, 
and show me why I'm wrong and show me how I'm wrong, then fine, I'll accept that. I'll, you know, I'll put my hands up and say, fine, fair enough. Um, but until they do that, then, you know, that gauntlet is there. Well, they're going to have a hard time saying that uh, Vice lied in his own journal then, right? That's that's the whole yeah, well, point. Yeah, exactly. You know, the guy is a known <laughs> – the guy actually is actually committed fraud earlier in his life, and that's provable that the guy committed fraud in another aspect of his life. And that's that's the evidence for that is, is there, and it's in black and white. There's no refuting that. It cannot be denied. You know, so this is the kind of guy we're dealing with here. You know, um, I'm not saying that, you know, a leopard, you know, doesn't change its spots and, you know, it's... It's possible. It's, it's possible. possible. Right. It's possible. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you for uh, getting up so early in the morning over there in Scotland and hanging out with us. It was just a tremendous show. It was everything that I expected and more. But please, uh, keep fighting the good fight. I look forward to your next book, and I look forward to your next appearance on Fade to Black. We're, we're going to talk a Cyrus next time around, okay? It's been an absolute pleasure. I've thoroughly enjoyed the show tonight, Jimmy. Thank you so much, Scott. And again, behave. No. <laughs> <laughs> Scott Crichton, everybody. Just go to innertraditions.com, and you can uh, uh, order the book uh, straight from there. Scott Creighton, the book is The Great Pyramid Hoax. And I got to tell you, it's it's been on my nightstand now uh, uh, for two months, and I've read through it and read through it again. It is a future reference book for everybody. Go and get the book now, The Great Pyramid Hoax by Scott Creighton. All right, before I let you go, um, and I want to thank Scott again for not only getting up early in the morning, but going into overtime with us over here. But there's a couple of things I got to get out of the way before we head to the end of the show. And the first thing, it happened this morning, hundreds of people around the upper Midwest, especially in Wisconsin and Illinois, uh, reported witnessing a fireball event. And it happened at around 1.30 a.m. Central Time. And the fireball was spotted by witnesses as far west as Wisconsin and as far east as New York. Now, uh, before you go hunting, oh, no, my computer's just crashed. <laughs> oh, man, my computer's just crashed straight in front of me. So there you go. All right. So no phone calls. All of that just went away. You got to love live radio. I'm looking at blank screens in front of me straight across the board. So, you know, with that, uh, I can't do anything. I, my hands are tied. The only thing that I have left over here to my right is the exit music. I don't have anything in front of me. Oh, man. What a drag. All right. I, I've got I've got nothing. I've got nothing. Okay. You know what? I, if, if I disappear out of here early, that means the network is not going to know what to do either. All right. Let me do this. I'm going to do this in real time. Okay. Um, let me just say this. I do actually want to do a wrap up on, on Scott. The point that I have made over and over again on this show is that when we look at the history of Egypt and we look at that magic number of 2650 BC and what allegedly was going on there, the rest of the world, and I am talking about uh, Northern Europe, the UK, uh, uh, the Americas, everybody at that point at 3000 BC is wrestling out of the Stone Age. The Stone Age. Everybody was forging for seeds in the ground. There was some semblance of, of things happening. But at that point, Mesopotamia hadn't happened. Ancient Sumer hadn't happened. If you go by the history books, right? And so suddenly, on Giza, on the plateau, Stone Age man just blossomed overnight and was able to walk into Giza, go up, take a limestone hill, a limestone hill and flatten it, flatten it, make uh, perfectly flat, align to magnetic north, 
and they were able to do this and bring in and quarry these blocks and level the blocks off and make them perfect and 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 build a foundation for the great pyramid that wouldn't sink into the ground it would be perfect four or five thousand years later allegedly this doesn't shift it doesn't move the king's chamber is as perfect today as it was whenever ago and that's that's the big mystery here they want us to accept this type of thought when it was indeed absolutely impossible there's just no way for this to happen now that's point number one that stone age man was able to go in square square limestone hill lop it off level it off quarry these rocks lay the foundation stones into place and that was all before the pyramid was built without any math, without any uh, high technology, without any equipment, that they were able to do this. And that was the start of it all. I need to drive this home, right? Everybody else is running around in animal skins, but yet the Egyptians were able to do this without any education, nobody teaching them. They just did this overnight, and we are forced to accept this fact. And then, on top of that, we are forced to accept the fact that they built a 40-story high structure out of two and a half million blocks of stone that remained the tallest structure in the world, in the world, until the Eiffel Tower. Stone Age man. I just don't buy into any of it. They had to have had some help. And that's if we that's if we accept their version of the story. They were able to it, it, not only if you if you accept that to the lower chamber, the low not the queen's chamber, the lower chamber, a three hundred foot tunnel, perfectly square and perfectly straight, was dug through that bedrock without any tools without any modern to do that today it would be nearly impossible it would be nearly impossible who would want to do it right perfectly straight perfectly square three foot square perfectly dug 300 feet down but we're forced into accepting this fact it just doesn't make any sense and then they turn around and go in the opposite direction and build the grand gallery Stone Age man, 3000 B.C., 2650 B.C. At 2650 B.C., it is so old and so long ago. Right now, Rita and I talk about this every single day, and, and she's down in the hall in her studio rolling her eyes because she knows what I'm about to say. But at 2650 B.C., Rome is still 2,000 years away into the future. Rome. Greece is 2,000 years away, 2,000 years. But yet we are forced to accept that this is what was going on in Giza. And that's where we call BS. They had some help if we accept their narrative. But I contend, and certainly listening to Scott and after reading his excellent book, those pyramids were already there. They were not built at 2650 B.C. The fourth dynasty, my friends, is removed. Khufu is removed. Menkare, what, what, everything else that, that Vice had brought forward on the Giza Plateau is all null. It's a moot point. Those pyramids were already there. Now, who built them? Don't know. When we look at what's going on right now down in Antarctica, this is a very important point, and what has been discovered in Gobekli Tepe clearly suggests that there were civilizations that predated everything else. It did not happen in Mesopotamia, in Iraq at 3000 B.C. It just plain and simply didn't. It didn't happen in, in Giza as, as they suggest. The pyramids were already there. I want to thank Scott Crichton today. and It is an amazing book. You can send email to jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Follow me on Twitter at jchurchradio. 
I've got no computers here. Everything is black here in the studio. The only thing that's feeding right now is the network and to you. So I want to thank everybody for coming on tonight. Thank you for the phone calls. Thank you for Twitter. Thank you to Scott. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. I have no notes in front of me. Hilton J. Paul, Mark D. Kovar. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> thank you, Jonas. Fade to Black's uh, uh, theme music is Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Music by Doug Aldrich.